Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Patrick McGinnis. I am the director of Eureka Alert. Uh, welcome to our 2007 PIO seminar. We really appreciate all of you coming today. Um, we appreciate all the great work you all are doing in uh, communicating science news. So we're very happy to be able to put on an event like this for you. Um, I hope you find it beneficial and helpful to uh, all your efforts in science communications. Um, I would like to thank everyone on the panel here today for uh, being here today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to be here at this program today. And um, I would like to thank uh, Spectrum Science Communications for their generous sponsorship of this program. We appreciate that as well. Um, and on that note, I would like to introduce John Singh from Spectrum Science Communications, and he would like to say a few words. I see like uh, four uh, nationally, internationally prominent reporters applauding for a PR guy. So you've seen, a, I think, a first here. Um, thank you very much for that applause from everybody. Thank you, Patrick, for your uh, introduction. And uh, Spectrum is indeed uh, thrilled to uh, work with the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Eureka Alert on uh, sponsoring, I think, now our fourth uh, program uh, with you. So that's, it's been a real privilege for us to join you in that regard. I specific, sp specifically wanted to thank uh, Jill Grigg and Rachman Culver from the Eureka Alert staff for just putting together a fantastic program. So I think those folks deserve an applause, too. <clears throat> And then very quickly from our staff uh, here at Spectrum, Emily Carone and uh, Sophia Alfred and Kara McCollum, uh, who have just done a great job on our end. So, so we, we thank you all. Spectrum's a health-focused public relations communications firm here based in Washington. Uh, I think the, the thing about uh, uh, our firm is that we have, I think we share with you all a very deep passion for uh, the subject of health care. And uh, it's something that uh, affects everyone who's ever lived, any time, any place. And I can't really think of another issue except for maybe uh, uh, being born and dying. That, uh, and, but healthcare is really everything, uh, uh, even pre-birth, uh, through through the the end of the stage here. So we, but we have a strong passion for that. And um, I think that someone who understands healthcare, someone who understands that passion and making the connection between. Uh, the worlds of uh, consumer information and education and uh, understanding, as well as the, the world of uh, communicating with physicians and uh, continuing medical education is none other than my friend Rhea Blakey. Now, uh, I don't know about all of you, but uh, I don't have, uh, I have you know, a bunch of friends, but, uh, but Rhea is one of my friends who, when I see her every time, I sort of also stand in awe of her. And, uh, and I know she's probably rolling her eyes or something like that right now. But, uh, but I really do because she's uh, been such an icon in media here in the Washington area as well as nationally uh, as a reporter for CNN uh, Healthcare and an award-winning journalist here. And uh, so I think that, uh, and also you know, uh, last and, and, and probably least, uh, helping Spectrum out with our media training of our, our clients and uh, helping us uh, get our messages right. So anyway, I wanted to thank Rhea for also uh, once again moderating this session, and uh, we're looking forward to another successful program. So Rhea, I think I'll turn it over to somebody who does a better job than I do. So thank you. Thank you, John. Right, Appreciate great. you. You're welcome. Hi. Good morning, everybody. John and I have a mutual admiration program going on here, so we won't go into that other than to say thank you for inviting me. Patrick, thank you very much for allowing me to host and moderate. Um, it is truly my pleasure. Uh, we are a little bit behind time, so as a good moderator, it's my job to keep forcing people to hurry up and get it done so that you can get your questions answered. So without going into a great deal of you know, introduction and so forth, we have five fabulous panelists who will be sharing great information that I'm sure that you can utilize in your everyday work life. And don't be bashful about your questions. That's why they're here. So do take advantage of the fact that they are present and here to address your needs. Because you don't always get that chance, do you? Not at all. I know. A lot of times you're really kind of banging on the door effortlessly, it would seem. But the idea is that we want to help each other 
to be able to get health information out. And I'm really thrilled that specifically this year we're working on communicating health news in particular across the media spectrum. We have journalists who represent uh, all outlets, or all types of outlets, if you will, uh, journalists who are managing editors, who are reporters, who are columnists. So there's a real good variety here, as I understand there is as well in the audience. We have people who represent government agencies, people who work specifically with universities. Um, I understand, and I could be wrong, the person who's traveled the farthest to come to this meeting is from Texas. Where are you, Steve? <laughs> There's Steve from Texas. No, is it? Is it Steve from Texas? Are you standing because of that? No, it was just an inopportune moment. <laughs> <laughs> which does happen on occasion, but we recover, don't we? So moving on, moving on, let's go ahead and get started with Glenn. Uh, Glenn O'Neill is actually the uh, assignment editor for health and medicine at USA Today. His very broad responsibilities, including in overseeing all of the papers, health and medical coverage, as well as online coverage. So he's really rather diverse in his capabilities. And I know one of the things that he really wants to focus on is something that you're very interested in, and that's how does the type of a media outlet impact the way he covers health and medical news? And since he's got a very wide range of outlets to consider, uh, you'll want to pay attention to his comments. Please welcome Glenn O'Neill. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning. It's good to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, as the sponsors of this event were kind enough to give us talking points for this uh, presentation, I, I will be very brief and, and go over an uh, overview of what I do and uh, some of the tips that I can offer because I think we can learn a lot more during the Q&A session. So I'm just going to go over a few things, um, if that's okay. But there was a question that they said, well, how does the type of media outlet you work for, newspaper, wire service, radio, online, impact how you cover health medical news? And I thought that was a great question because it's no longer that concrete anymore. Um, USA Today has a circulation of a little over 2.2 million every day, the newspaper does, but we reach over 5.5 million people every day. When you add up the online visitors, the mobile, uh, the print, and the, uh, we have also mobile alerts. We have people can sign up to get uh, news on their cell phone. So if you add all that up, we reach an audience of 5.5 million every day. And our paper, just like I think most media outlets, is, is changing rapidly. Um, once we were just primarily a print outlet, but now we're becoming a newspaper, online news writer, and using other technology to reach people. In fact, both our online and our print newsrooms were merged about two years ago. It's still an ongoing process that we're uh, working on, but for the most part, it's considered one operation. It used to be the online was a totally separate thing, and and they did, they did what they did, we did what we did, and we hardly ever worked together, but now that's no longer the case. We work together on a daily basis. So we're looking for, you know, you, on any given day, you're trying to tell your story on at least those two uh, formats. Now that's not, in a set, sometimes the subject matter dictates the format and also it may dictate where a story is played. Um, it, quite frankly, a story may come in and we write it, put it on the web, and it, it never sees light of day in the paper because it's a breaking story or we may totally redo it for print the next day or later on. Uh, but that said, on a lot of the enterprise stories that we're looking on, we're looking for online audio, uh, video opportunities, um, really big on using that online. So uh, it's, it's a rapidly changing newsroom and it's, just don't think of USA Today is just a, is a newspaper itself because we're using a lot of different uh, technology. Some other tips I can offer is, is to, for you to get to know the reporters and the types of stories that they do. And it's really not that difficult to do that. Are you, if you're familiar with a publication, if you read USA Today on a couple week basis, you can tell which reporters are, are covering certain topics fairly easy. Now, you know, there's, you know, general assignment stuff comes up and people will, will venture a, you know, a little away from what they do, but over time you can tell that fairly easy. And But generally speaking, we're looking for stories that have or will have a direct impact on readers' lives. Uh, things that, that will change how their interactions with the doc, their doctors or things that they can do um, themselves to, to better their lives. Now that's, obviously that's, you know, um, not a hard fast rule because, you know, the gee whiz stories human interest stories that not, not, may not affect a lot of people will still cover those because uh, people have a lot of interest in that. I mean, the example I use in science is a, a you know, dinosaur find. It's not really going to change your life, but people like to read about that kind of thing. <laughs> so we'll be doing those. But you can tell what, you know, we're not looking for product stories. I, I don't think 
you know, we get pitches all the time from, from groups that, you know, we've got some a vacuum cleaner that really gets all the dust out and that's really helpful for allergies. And I'm like, you know, that's, if you know our publication, you know that's something that we're not going to do. So, you know, take a look at that. Some other tips I would offer is that, you know, be willing and open to discuss the other side of the issue. I, something that, one thing that I've noticed a little bit is of, of PIOs trying to steer a story of like, okay, here's the story and this, and, and these are the people you can talk to. That's fine, but, the, the, but if like the opposing angle comes up, they start to get a little um, pushback on that, and the reporters can see through that in a heartbeat. So, you know, that's, I would highly recommend not doing that. That's just something I've noticed a little bit in the last year or so, more, more so in the past. So I thought that was kind of um, interesting. And the last tip that I give before I turn this off about how to reach us, you know, I would highly recommend email is the best way to reach of reporters and, and staffers as opposed to calling um, or snail mail or what have you. Because I think, you know, I get a, a 200 emails a day. Now, not all of that uh, are from um, pitches, but quite a bit of them are. I, actually, I look at every single one of them. I may not respond, but if, if it's something that I like right away, I'll get back to you. Or if it's something that can work down the, down the road, I'll put, tuck it away in a folder somewhere. But I'm not going to get back to you because if I did that, I wouldn't be able to do anything else. But that said, you know, it's really hard for to, to deal with phone pitches. I really don't have time for that. And I'm not an unfriendly person or trying to be rude, but just understand, especially when people call in late in the afternoon, you know, and I'm at my desk, I've got stories coming in, and the last thing I need to do is, is hear a five-minute pitch about something. So just send me an email is the best way to do that. And while I, this is a little off topic, but I, I was looking at your reporter directory 2007. I, I correct one thing. Steve will thank me for this later. And under USA Today, you'll see Steve Sternberg. He's, what, he's one of our health reporters. It says global public health and science. That's, no, he covers heart disease, AIDS, public health. So just, he'll thank me later so he doesn't get a bunch of pitches for science stories. He'll, he'll me. He did cover the Human Genome Project. Maybe that's why science came up on that. But uh, for science stories, I would suggest getting in touch with Susan Kelly. As a, um, in medical stories, you can you know, get in touch with me on that. So those are just the general uh, tips that I was going to offer. Um, and I really look forward to answering your questions, because I really don't want to you know, be up here and just chit-chatting too terribly long, because uh, I think that I can best help you when during the Q&A session. So again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you, and I uh, look forward to our discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to guess that one of the questions you may get, Glenn, is about uh, how do we make sure that our email is the one that you read. Uh, if there are 200 coming through, obviously you want to know tips that, you know, what's going to spark him maybe in the uh, subject line to take a look at your email versus somebody else. So I just plant that little seed so that we can have, you know, interesting and, you know, effective, productive dialogue. Um, but somebody who obviously does that on a regular basis is Sally Squires. We're so thrilled to have Sally here today. The post is right around the corner, as many of you know, but sometimes it's hardest to get there when you are closest. Um, without further ado, I know she's got a lot of information she wants to share with you, some of it specific to maybe the differences between 20th century and 21st century news gathering that you'll really want to pay close attention to. So please welcome Sally Squires from the Washington Post. Thank you. Good to see you. We've, got a, we've got a quick PowerPoint, and, and, I'll, um, and I too, you're going to hear a lot of common themes. Glenn and I could have swapped our... Uh, our presentation here, but here we go. So I, I was thinking, okay, how has news changed? And I, I hate to admit this, but I, I have been around town for a while, so I, I have seen the changes. Okay, so 20th century, we actually went to press conferences. I did go to one last week for the uh, food pyramid, which was uh, that USDA released for uh, pregnant moms and for uh, breastfeeding moms, but truly we don't go very often to press conference anymore. More likely are the teleconferences, even the FDA has gotten into this, where we will have throughout the E. e coli uh, scare, we had regular briefings. Now there are downsides to this. It's often hard to get, I've been on these teleconferences where I'm pushing and pushing and pushing the button to try to, answer, to get a question answered and never get in the queue. So that's sometimes not so good. Oops, what have I done here? 
how do I, I don't know why we're getting the next button, but there we go. Oh, okay, let me go back. There we go. So then um, sometimes, oh, whoops, I'm sorry. Let's see if I can, no. Well, we'll go back, we'll, let's see. Let me go. Sorry about this. You'll see it, you, you'll know it. These are the Cliff Notes, this is the Cliff Notes version and then you'll get it, okay. So, um, press conference, scientific meetings. Again, I love personally going to scientific meetings. We have no budget. So unless they're here, and unless I really, really convince my editors otherwise, we don't go all very often to scientific meetings. I think it's a huge loss. I have found through the years that uh, presentations are first made at the scientific meetings, and you get to schmooze with all the scientists, you get make great contacts, unfortunately. I don't cover politics and I don't cover the Olympics. That's all coming up next year. Next year, our budget just doesn't have money to go to scientific meetings very often. So what I do, do appreciate is that getting the abstract books, all the information as much as possible ahead of time, and that way I can look through those. I really do read through them. I keep them for references. It's very, very valuable, and that's one way that I can cover the meeting without uh, necessarily being on site. Also, we have webcasts and phone briefings. And again, those are useful as long as you can actually ask the question. We used to get journals by mail. Now we get them by email. It's wonderful. It's not so great for acti physical activity, which is another part of my job, but um, in trying to get people to move more and eat less. But, um, but it is uh, very helpful. And it has speeded up the news cycle. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but increasingly, you know, we get New England Journal by email. We get JAMA by email. I use, I do use Eureka Alert almost every week, if not daily. And I'm a, a huge user of PubMed, which to look at the original paper or at least the abstract as much as possible. So, I think this is. Um, there we go. Okay. Changing news organizations. Okay. The fact is, and I like to say people are, are moaning about the loss of, uh, of newspapers and circulation. Same thing is happening to the nightly news. I think we're in an evolution because as you heard Glenn say, 2.2 million readers of USA Today, 5 million total on the site. We have about 900,000 readers of the Sunday uh, Washington Post. We have about 770,000 of the daily paper, but online, we know we have 10 million unique users monthly. I know that my Lean Plate Club column reaches 6 million people every week because it's nationally syndicated. I have 275,000 people who subscribe to my email newsletter, and that doesn't count the web chat or the other ways that people reach me. So in many ways, we're changing, um, but... It's not always an easy change. Okay, so we're, we are seeing the rise of the internet. And you also heard, Glenn, I'm so glad that you actually are thinking phone messages last year for the holiday challenge, which is something we run for the Lean Play Club. I actually wrote uh, phone messages, premium phone me messages that people could buy. And as one of my cousins quipped, he said, well, I'll bet there's a Pulitzer for that. So, you know, so we are switching you know, constantly. And there are new outlets, um, cable, satellite uh, news, satellite radio in particular, uh, we, you know, uh I go on radio almost at least once a week, so there are all different kinds of things that are happening uh, these days. Let me see if I can get to the next one. Okay, so this has generated a 24-7 news cycle, and this actually came up to bite me and a, um, and a, a representative who go unnamed of the federal government um, in a PIO office recently because uh, what we do now at the Post is we often file first for the web. This particular person saw the web story and thought I was done, that that would be the story that would then go into the next day's paper, wrong. We not only file for the web, but we're updating the web as, throughout the day, and then I'm filing often a different version of the story for the daily paper. So it is a, it's almost like being I first came to Washington for Newhouse News Service, and we were never quite as fast as AP and UPI, but it's very similar to that kind of chronic news cycle, and, um, and that's, that's good and bad. Um, but 
it's something for you to be aware of that just because you see something on the web doesn't mean that that's the final version. So keep, keep feeding the information. We used to only write print stories. Well, now I carry, I can't believe it, but I've interviewed Jack LaLanne and I took a video camera with me and I, f I photographed him and I put, we put the video up on the web and I wrote the story. Now, I, thankfully, I also had a wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning pr uh, print photographer with me because initially I couldn't get the camera to work. So there are downsides to this, okay? And I'm not saying that we're gonna do them all well, you know, but it's, it is very, very very interesting. And I have a friend at NPR, a former producer that I worked with, and she said she realized that when she was pushing out the mic and then also had to take notes that somehow there weren't enough hands. So this is, this is a problem, but you're going to see print reporters doing more of the, the video and the photography, and you're going to see broadcast reporters doing blogs and other, other things to help them uh, write. So let's see if I can do that. Ah, it worked. Yay. Okay, so the opportunities. Okay, because I like to look at the upside. I don't want to look at the downside, just the downside here. Opportunities are this huge reach. Who would have thought? I've been at the Post for a long time. We were always a local paper. Now we are an international paper. I regularly talk to readers from, by email from as far away as Israel, Australia, Spain. They're all over. It's fantastic. So that's great. The downside, a lot of these messages are getting lost in this huge cacophony of information. And I worry about the quality of the information that is out there. And I think it's very hard, and this is where I hope news organizations are going to rise to the top, that every, everybody can be a blogger. But that information, I don't believe, is as valuable as what a reporter who has spent a lot of time and been trained to get, gather information and think about you know, weighing both sides um, in, and hopefully doing it in a dis dispassionate way can provide that information in a whole different way than a blogger who's obviously got a vested interest. Okay, quick access. Nothing but, I mean, can you imagine that we used to have to put out special editions if something happened. Now we can put it up on the website like that. And so that's terrific. But the problem sometimes are errors. And of course, the public has an increasingly short attention span. And if, and we, you know, and we probably do too. I mean, think how many times you probably flip that, that flipper if you don't like what's on. The other thing that there are new avenues for you. In my email newsletter every week, I'm looking for things to promote or to tell people about. And I don't mean promote in terms of necessarily promoting products, but I'm looking for things that I can provide information uh, different tools that will underscore whatever I'm writing in a particular column. And we're doing this also for the daily paper. So we're, we're always making this a richer experience. And that's really exciting because it gives you all kinds of opportunities. At the same time, there's a shrinking news hole. Newsprint costs a lot. There's a shrinking time on broadcast. But the good side is that the electrons on the internet are almost limitless, and they're really cheap. So, you know, again, pluses and minuses. Now, okay, so what can you do? The more you can provide us, at least this is, I'm speaking personally, but I really need URLs. So if you've got a, if you've got the, a great um, new article in the New England Journal, in JAMA, in Obesity, in whatever you've got, if I can get the actual URL, that allows me to be able to link to it, not only in the story, in the post, and in the syndicated column, but also in the email newsletter. And so I can reach people. And what I love about this, is that it allows the reader who is interested to really dig deep. They can see the original information, and I think that's a real win-win. Photos, video, and graphics. When I was a cub reporter at, uh, at the St. Petersburg Times in Florida, I remember my bureau chief saying, okay, you guys, you gotta think pictures. You gotta think pictures. It's not just the words. Well, now we not only think pictures, we think video, we think audio, we think graphics. We're working hand-in-hand -hand to make things, uh, we did, this year, some healthy snacks. We rolled over the healthy snacks and they had all the nutrition information that was on the web. So we're really going deep. It's very time consuming. I'm not asking you for, to do our job for us, but the more information you can provide for us, the better. Get to know key reporters in your field. You heard Glenn say the same thing. It's not hard. And I also recommend, I'm a board member of the National Association of Science Writers, so forgive the plug here, but um, do get to, those are people who are going to know 
your field. They're going to know your language. And one of the concerns that I have and a lot of other reporters have is that sometimes, as wonderful as the people are on the web, they may be trained in HTML coding and other things that I don't even know about, but they weren't necessarily trained as journalists. So it's really important to get to the people that you know will do your at least a good job with what you, you're trying to get across. They may not say exactly what you want to say, but you know they'll give you a fair, um, you know, a fair reading and they'll evaluate and write well. So that's really important. And you can reach NASW at that URL. And then here's where you can reach me, and I look forward to your questions. I do. I also really like email for uh, communication, and like Glenn, I get a lot. But if you can put something good in the subject line, I'll usually see it, and, and we'll at least get back or forward it on to a colleague or can write you a quick, um, a quick email in return. And I do, phone calls are okay, but, he, but Glenn is right. It's, you know, we don't like them very often, and usually I then tell people to email me. So, you know, phone call is the second best. And forget U.S. mail. We actually have to go to, unless it's something that can only come that way, we actually have to go to, because of the anthrax con concern, we actually go to a room that is separate from the newsroom with a separate air supply to open our mail. It's really, you know, onerous, and nobody likes to do it. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Sally makes some really good points uh, all throughout her presentation, but just as you were concluding there, I was thinking uh, when I was at CNN, and this has been a few years ago, but this, I covered anthrax there. And uh, we also had a mail room that was separate with a separate air supply. And people would send me things. At that time, I was still getting the, new, uh, the US, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA, you know, in the, the magazine. And, you know, by the time I got it, we were into the next issue based on what I could get online. So, I mean, it really doesn't make sense in this 24-hour news cycle. But, of course, the other thing is that, you know, we've all been kind of forced to move into this new generation of news coverage. And so sometimes uh, speed is really key. It's not just what you say, but how quickly you can get the information to somebody who will pass it along to the masses. And sometimes that means we have to be really diverse in the way we think about approaching people. Um, one of the things that, that I currently do as well as work with Spectrum and media training is I host a show for Discovery Health Channel, which is a CME show, Continuing Medical Education. And one of the challenges we have with that show is always making sure that we can reach the younger docs because they learn differently than those of us who are dinosaurs uh, used to learn. And not that I'm saying I'm a physician at all, but just because we had a different way, a different structure of learning before we really got deeply involved in the internet. And so when we think of people who are younger and perhaps more progressive, we really do have to focus on how they take information in. So as part of the news gathering process, I thought it was key that we had uh, someone who's a little bit more of a junior compared to some of the rest of us, and that would be Adam Voiland, who is from uh, US News and World Report um, and who, you know, look, started off as an intern a few years back, has a couple of fabulous degrees from Brown University, but is really making his mark now uh, as a reporter. And I think it might be really key to kind of focus on his perspective in regards to gathering and communicating health news uh, throughout a variety of mediums. So, Adam, we're pleased to have you. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you so much. Um, she's being a little nice to me. It's it's only been a year, actually, um, not a few years. Um, so yeah, the, you know, this is for me. This is this is all about really first impressions in a way. And I I can maybe um, just tell you what I see. Um, so I've, I'm at U.S. News. I've been here like a, a, about a year. Um, I'm uh, in the health and medicine section. Um, and U.S. News, as you probably know, weekly, um, we, the circulation is about two million. We have a website with daily fresh content. Um, the numbers are always sort of evolving. I think they say the health page has maybe five million uh, unique visitors a month or something like that. Um, one of the big pushes these days at U.S. News is is very is very um, powerfully towards what they call news you can use. Um, this sort of consumer consumer health um, angle. What does this mean to the everyday person? What kind of changes um, can they make in their life? A as a reporter, that's sometimes very fun. It's sometimes sometimes you sort of want to pound your head against the wall too because it can get a little old. But um, but people. I mean, I think the good news on that is. Um, people are really excited about health news. And that's one of the reasons I came into this. I'm starting out um, 
I'm interested in science reporting too, and then it's, you know, let's try, I'll try health, and I'm, I'm amazed because you know, the health is so often on the top of most email lists. Um, you know, there, there's more and more websites all the time, and people, people care about this stuff. I mean, it's their lives, so that's that's very exciting, and I think, you know, I think it's a good reason for for journalists and um, public information officers to to really work together because people care about this. It's great in a way. Um, so in general, as far as working with um, PIOs, um, I generally like it. I mean, the, the people are nice. I, I uh, get plenty of story ideas. Um, they help me find sources. Uh, they send me all sorts of interesting information and pitches. Um, but as others have said, um, they can also drive me um, a little nuts sometimes. And <laughs> it's certainly that that call, that, that cold call that you get on deadline um, from somebody who's very, very enthusiastic telling you about this great, incredible new study um, that tells you, you know, probiotic dog toys are 94% effective at preventing fleas, bites, or whatever it is. And it's just um, sometimes I agree that email first is a, is a good way to go. Um, in terms of a few uh, just general tips in terms of what, what helps me, um, in terms of pitches, because um, of course I get a lot of them and it is hard to sort through them. Um, one thing that helps a lot, when you send a press release, send supporting links too. I mean, don't just send the study, but I mean, help us out. Um, or I mean, it will help us out if, if you send maybe some background information, four or five links, maybe even to a conflicting opinion um, or a policy statement from some other medical organization, that would help. It, 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 will, it will make me really want to look at that pitch as opposed to one that's just talking about this specific study. Um, email first, um, as some of us have talked about. Um, as others have said too, send multimedia. Um, we have yeah, like we have to think about video and pictures, um, and that um, we have the, the web to fill, um, and we need your help with that. Um, another thing is to be be transparent about who you're representing. Um, it's sometimes um, I, I was writing. I I wrote a story about bed bugs at one point, and. Um, you know, if you're getting a study, if the study is coming from a company who's um, involved in exterminating bed bugs and they're telling you how there are bed bugs everywhere, I mean, just be be upfront about that. I mean, it's okay, um, but we just that we want to. It, it helps to um, know about those commercial interests so that we don't have to spend so much time trying to sort through them. Um, and of course, think about the reporter's beats. I cover men's health and environmental health. Um, a lot of times I get really great pitches um, for something I just don't cover. And then, so I just, you know, I don't respond to those emails or whatnot. But it doesn't mean they're not good ideas. Um, I think my, my last two sort of first impressions on coming into this field, um, um, I think it's, like I said, it's an exciting field because people care so much about health news. Um, but I think we also have to be really, really careful in communicating health news, um, especially there, there's two specific things I wanted to offer to you. Um, I think a lot of times health news, it, it, we both do it, you know, the journalists and um, public information officers, you know, certain stories get hyped in a way. And I think one thing that we can really look for in our, um, in our reporting is to be careful about how we talk about risk um, instead of talking just about relative risk, like I'm working on a story about air pollution and heart and its connection to the uh, heart problems right now, you know, in that story or in any of your pitches, you can say, you know, if 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 you're if you exercise near traffic, your you know your risk of getting a heart attack. This st this study shows it's, it's going to quadruple or something like that. Um, which is exactly what the study says, but I think we would we would be doing a disservice if we don't also say that that risk is very very small in the first place. That maybe th that quadrupling was one person in a million compared to four people in a million, uh, and that comes up a lot. You know, in in press releases, you'll see something. Oh, this is a really amazing study, but when you actually look at the stats, it's like, hmm. You know, we have to be careful about that. And then the other thing like that is just to be careful about um, 
the different types of studies that, out, that are out there. There's clinical trials and there are epidemiological studies, and, and some studies really show cause and effect, and some studies don't. Um, and I think we all want to be careful about um, being as upfront with our readers as we can about what, it sh what, what the study is showing and what we don't really know yet, even though frustratingly, it's, it doesn't always make a good story, but I think it's the right thing to do for readers is to give them the, the cautions as just as much as we want to tout, you know, this is new and this works really well. And I look forward to the Q&A. So Adam, I, I have to tell you this. Uh, when I first started in journalism eons ago, uh, one of the new key phrases was news you can use. <laughs> so I don't know if that's everything old is new again or we've got a new spin on it, but I think the bottom line is, is that there are certain things that people focus in on that makes a difference in their lives and that's, that is the bottom line. <laughs> But um, you know, as journalists, sometimes uh, those of us who are reporting to various you know producers and managing editors, and we have one coming up next, um, we'll get a little frustrated with, okay, the mission is still to get the information out properly, accurately, immediately. You know, sometimes there is that issue of uh, how do we make our news organization different than somebody else's? You know, is is ours? You know, the sexy news to watch. You know what I'm saying. So we can get a little bogged down in in-house baseball, but the bottom line is people still want to know what they want to know. So we appreciate your comments. Look forward to the questions that are going to come his way, because I know you've got something interesting for him. Um, but also next on our panel, we have Ed Tobias. Now, Ed is with the Associated Press Broadcasts. Ed is an assistant managing editor for them, uh, for the broadcast division. Um, I should tell you that he led their broadcast coverage on uh, the September 11th attack. Uh, tax, the uh, Columbia and Challenger shuttle disasters, and the death of Pope John Paul II. So he's really well versed in his coverage, but he focuses primarily at this stage on their uh, broadcast wires, the radio network, as well as their online video operations. And you hear an ongoing theme here about how it's not just print or just radio or just television. Everybody's really sort of covering the gamut, so that's something to keep in mind when uh, your questions come. But please, at this time, welcome Ed Tobias. Good morning, everybody. I'm the electronic journalist in this bunch, so I can do it all in 30 seconds <laughs> for you. Uh, I'm also the non-medical journalist of the bunch. I'm a generalist, but I do have some connections uh, to the medical field. Uh, full disclosure, my wife is a physical therapist, and uh, back when I was in high school and in college, I worked in the emergency room at Roosevelt Hospital in Manhattan, and if you want an education, work in an ER in a midtown Manhattan hospital. Um, it got me uh, interested in news. Uh, another reason I went into news was because I thought I wanted to be a doctor. That's why I was working at Roosevelt Hospital. And I had a very wise high school advisor who said, you know, you're not very good at math or science. Why don't you go into broadcasting? I said, sure, why not? So here I am today. Been with the AP for a little over 26 years now. Uh, all of that time in Washington. Richard Nixon was president when I first came to, to D.C. You know who Nixon was? <laughs> uh, but in that 26 years, I have never seen a change in the focus of an organization uh, such as I've seen in the past 18 months to two years at AP in terms of turning the big elephant around and moving from a text-oriented organization to one that is very truly oriented on text and video and audio and graphics all together. And when dealing with you and in dealing with the stories uh, that you are working with us on, you need to be remembering, just as Sally has mentioned, that there are various elements to the story and we need them all. Now, we're serving 6,500 broadcasters, but we're also serving about 1,000 newspapers. And those 1,000 newspapers, all of a sudden, need more than just the text story. But it's not just 
the elements, it's the type of elements that we need in order to make a story complete uh, these days. If you are pitching a story about a new process, about uh, a particular uh, medical procedure, uh, for example, we need to humanize that story in all elements. So, if you're telling us there's going to be a spectacular operation, new procedure never performed before, I need to be able to have an interview with a doctor, with hopefully the patient prior to surgery, with the patient hopefully after the surgery, perhaps with a family member, uh, and maybe we need some video of the surgery if it's a particularly visual technique. Maybe it's video that we go into the OR to gather, maybe it's video that you provide to us. Uh, it all goes together. Maybe there's animation of a scientific process um, that you have that will help us to illustrate the story. This translates also into needing lead time. If you're doing something today and it's really going to be of interest to us and we're able to gather all of the elements that we need to tell the story well, we need to know about it three days before it happens, a week before it happens. Uh, we get stories uh, regularly from the journals that were mentioned, uh, New England Journal, uh, American Academy of Peds, uh, of Neurology, Science Magazine, what have you, um, with HFRs on them, um, which we, uh, we hold true and dear. Uh, but in the, in the HFRs, even there, we don't always have enough time to gather the elements that we need. So if we're able to get the information even a week in advance, uh, that's really great because we can work with our print reporters uh, to really formulate a multimedia story. Um, in addition to providing information to newspapers, uh, we're providing it to radio stations, we have a radio network, uh, we're providing it uh, in an online video network, um, all of the elements come together into a true television package for the online video network. We work regularly with our science reporters, um, our specialists, who are primarily print reporters. Uh, a name that you should know if you don't know it already is Kit Frieden, who is uh, AP's uh, primary science editor. She works out of uh, AP headquarters in New York. And the primary medical reporter uh, for AP is Marilyn Marchione, who works out of uh, our Milwaukee bureau, just because she happens to be in Milwaukee, no particular reason other than that. There are other specialists in health and medicine, in general science, in space flight, and NASA, in dealing with government agencies, who I would hope uh, you would know uh, in relationship to your own areas of expertise. But KIT is the key in terms of coverage, and she regularly is working with us on the electronic side to bring all of the elements together on stories. Uh, an example of elements. This morning, as I was sitting here, popping up on my email was, let me just scroll down to it because 17,000 have come in since that one came in half an hour ago. Uh, just to note that the USDA has announced a nationwide frozen pizza recall. I don't make these up, this is true. Uh, approximately 3.3 million pounds of uh, something that I would have to open up to see. I don't know what it is yet. What am I going to need on that? I'm going to need somebody to talk to me uh, about that. I'm going to need pictures of the pizzas. I'm going to have to go out to uh, supermarkets and get in there again to get the element and get that visual element. Um, takes time. What will make your email unique so that I read it or that uh, one of my reporters reads it? Well, if you have been helpful to me or to one of my reporters in getting us someone to react to a spot story such as this, we're going to remember your name and know that you're a good person to deal with and can work quickly 
and uh, your email is more likely to be looked at. Uh, if you have something that is truly unique uh, to pitch to us, uh, try and put that in the first line of the uh, email rather than burying the lead down uh, seven paragraphs in it because we're never going to get down to the, the seventh paragraph. Um, I'm bouncing around a little bit because I forgot to mention something, and that is it was mentioned uh, about the FDA teleconferences. Uh, I hated those teleconferences. Why? Can you guess? No visuals. And I think they did that on purpose. I think they didn't want to go on camera, and that's why they held these darn teleconferences, so that you'd talk to them on the telephone, but they wouldn't appear on camera. FDA has been tough to deal with uh, over the past uh, couple of years, and one of the things that they're doing that makes it tough for us is holding teleconferences rather than making their people available to us. What else can you do? Young woman walked up to me and handed me her card, uh, Tara Ellis, um, Medical Research Institute in Buffalo, where it hasn't snowed yet, she tells me. Uh, and she said, you know, the head of our institute is a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. That's great, and we talk to, we try and call Nobel Prize winners just after they've won the, the prize to talk to them about their, uh, their work. And what's the problem with Nobel Prize winners? They don't speak, people speak. <laughs> they speak science talk. Same thing in D.C. We have government ease. You would do us a great service if you would talk to the people who we might interview before we talk to them and just brief them a little bit on how to translate their great discovery into something that Joe Schmo listening to the radio or going onto the website can understand in simple declarative sentences. So, you help us a lot, no question about it. Uh, we appreciate the help that you give to us. Uh, if you are available to us 24-7, it's even better, uh, because the 24-hour news cycle uh, that has always been there for radio, has always been there for the wires, is now there for everybody. And if we can't get you within half an hour or an hour of when we need you, we're gonna go somewhere else to find someone to talk to us. So, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I'm gonna have to praise our panelists today because uh, I went down the line individually before we got started, you know, and said to each of them, listen, 15 minutes, don't go over, I'm gonna have to smack you in the knees. <laughs> and to the letter, now let's see what Michael does, but to the letter, each of them has gone significantly under, which means more time for you. So if you would just let them know that you appreciate their generosity for your time and possibility of asking questions, I think they'd greatly appreciate that. Now would be good. Now let's see what Michael does. Michael Waldholtz is uh, with the Bloomberg News, and, and he confided in me that um, uh, he's a little bit behind the scenes, obviously, as, as a managing editor, um, not so much up front as a reporter, but he still has, he's a great gatekeeper, okay? So the good thing is, is that you really do still want to know him and have access to him. He is one of those people who speaks people speak. Uh, he's written a couple of books. He's got a, a wide-ranging background, what, 25 years um, as a medical and science reporter and news editor at the Wall Street Journal. So he knows everybody and everything. And I'm sure you're going to get a great deal of information out of what it is he has to say. And remember, after this, we will have the opportunity for the question and answer period. I'll very briefly remind you that uh, there are some surveys in your packet somewhere that uh, the folks at Eureka Alert, AAS, AAAS, and Spectrum would like you to fill out. So just keep that in mind. But we'll, we will be delving into your part of the program as soon as we hear from Michael. So give him a warm welcome, please. I was all geared up to be short. Uh, 
Thank you, Rhea. It's a real pleasure to be here. And in fact, uh, point, Rhea pointed out uh, before we started uh, that I was at the end of the line here, and by the time we got to me, there might not be any time for my presentation. So uh, in line with this uh, new electronic age of uh, journalism that we're all pointing to and the Web 2.0 world of communications, whatever that is, uh, I want to let you know I, bought, I uh, downloaded, uh, I have a podcast of my presentation. You can download it off the internet. Listen to it as you ride home tonight. How's that, Rhea? That's good. Are you done? No. <laughs> I'm never done. Okay. Uh, I, I, there are two places in which you can see Bloomberg. Uh, it, it, I joined Bloomberg two years ago, and I'll get to where, how that happened for a second. But there is a, a public website that you can go to and give you a flavor of the kind of news we're doing. Uh, I'll go through it in a bit. So it's, it's up there, and we'll we'll phase through it. But the, the the real power of Bloomberg is is the machine, as we call it, or the terminal that our subscribers uh, have on their desk. It's a it's a two screen terminal that uh, takes you into an extraordinary world of of uh, of, anal of uh, aggregated information and data and analytics. Uh, that is almost impossible to describe, and so I'm not going to describe it all because I just want to talk a bit about the news side and especially the health and science news side, but I'm open to questions, and I, I am open to talking to people about it. We're very proud of what Bloomberg is doing. I can tell you when I got there two years ago, I had no idea what was going on. Uh, Bloomberg's impact on the media worldwide is often unseen uh, by the general, you know, by the, by the People in the general news, but people in the media know about it. We're being followed. We're setting. We're setting the pace. We, I can see the coverage, our impact on coverage, almost every day because we're real time. We're real fast. We're really now, and you know anything you read in the Washington Post today, we already had yesterday, and probably even the day before. <laughs> and that that and that includes its its website to a certain extent because Bloomberg is designed. To try to, inter to try to beat the commodification of what we call the commodification of news. Almost any one of us can go Google right now and get almost, or even many people can get on Eureka Alert and see anything that is publicly available, either anything that was put out in a press release or any, anything related to a, a government statement or a, a new study that, that you know, has already hit an embargo. And so uh, why would anyone want to pay $20,000 a year if you could get it free. And so what does Bloomberg have to do? We have to provide not only value to that, that press release, uh, but we have to break news and be ahead of it. And so that's our goal. We do it a lot. We don't do it all the time. Uh, but first, let me just talk about my favorite subject, me. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, I joined Bloomberg about after 25 years at the Wall Street Journal, where uh, very fortunately I, was, I, I was, had the opportunity to cover almost every medical science story from 1978 to 2005, 2004, I guess. Uh, and my specialty, uh, because um, one of my main assignments was covering the pharmaceutical and biotech industry as well as, uh, as the health insurance uh, uh, business, was to cover the intersection of science and medicine and health, as well as public health, uh, with business and economics. Uh, you know, back in 1978, that was actually a very uh, unique thing to do. Everyone. It uh, sort of does it now in some form or way. Uh, uh, you know, the, at the Wall Street Journal, it, that was the focus, uh, really. The, you know, it was the focus of how capitalism, I, I guess the main idea was how capitalism in all its forms, but mostly here in the American form, but it's spreading all over the world. Uh, I think uh, George Bush would be pleased to say it, uh, that capitalism is, is really what is inspiring, I think the word we remember is inspiring, propelling and often distorting uh, the behavior of scientists, uh, scientific and academic institutions, uh, policymakers in the health field in particular, and, and of course health, all healthcare product companies. At Bloomberg, writing about that is our mission, pure and simple. Uh, I arrived at Bloomberg in 2005 with the, go with the uh, goal of intensifying and expanding that focus, uh, and as a result, uh, we uh, really built up the team. I, I actually have three separate teams that I oversee globally, one in the U.S., one in Europe, and one in Asia. It's about a total of 45 reporters and editors uh, in numerous bureaus. Uh, in, in Europe, it's in London, uh, Geneva, uh, uh, Frankfurt, uh, Munich, uh, Budapest, Paris. Uh, in Asia, we're in Singapore, uh, Beijing, Hong Kong, Tokyo, 
uh, uh, Bangkok. And here in the U.S., we have a, a lot fewer bureaus, US, uh, New York, uh, Washington. We have a very large group here, uh, Boston and, and San Francisco. Uh, so who are our readers? Uh, I think it's really important to know uh, that, uh, again, we, we have a public website and people, anyone can come and see it. What you're looking at right now is the so-called front page that a uh, person who pays uh, uh, $20,000 a year. So clearly, you have to have a real vested interest to be a Bloomberg user, and of course, the vast majority of them is 270,000 subscribers who pay $20,000 a year, so you get instantly the business model of Bloomberg. We don't have to rely on advertising, although we do have TV, as you know, and radio. We have a, a magazine, and now we have a, a, a public website that does get some advertising. But the vast majority of our, of our economic model is built straight on the subscription, 20,000 times 270,000. Do the math, and we're doing very well. We're growing faster than we've ever grown before. It's not clear why, but part of the reason is in this world of, of difficult investment, and anyone who's following the business news knows how hard the times are, so everyone needs an edge. Bloomberg provides the edge, because what Bloomberg does is it, it has become the world's premier aggregator of, of information on economic news. Uh, because not only do we provide information that Bloomberg creates itself, but we also bring in information uh, that everyone else provides. Bloomberg now has a searching system that it didn't have a year ago, in which uh, a user, uh, again, a Bloomberg user, uh, can do a Google-type search uh, for a piece of news, and we're scraping almost every website worldwide and adding new ones every day, so that we're not only pulling in your Bloomberg news and AP, um, and, and sometimes even Reuters, although that's a little difficult. They, they don't appreciate that, but Dow Jones and Wall Street Journal, but almost any website around the world, so any news story that's happening, whether it's in Australia or North Korea uh, or, or Hungary or Turkey, uh, we can have it. We also have a, a sort of an alert system so that you can, the user can actually set up the system himself. So if you're just looking for news related to uh, bird flu in, in India, uh, almost any day, any story re related to that around the world on any website will instantly pop up when it pops up on that website. It's this spidering technology that, of course, none of us understand, but it's extraordinary to use. And so what's happened is it, when we sell this machine to a Bloomberg user, we want them to just be on the Bloomberg and, and nothing else. So uh, let's come back to, new, uh, to health and science. We want the, the Bloomberg user to go nowhere else for their health and science news. And that's a tremendous uh, responsibility on us. And it means that uh, it's why we have so many reporters and editors, because we want to be able to write about every important journal study. And we often are doing it. We want to cover, and Sally, I'm sorry you can't be attending the, the meetings, because I agree with you. As a reporter, the science meetings is how I became a any good at, at being. I mean, it's where I got my breakthroughs, and it is something I believe in, as well as uh, Reg Gale, who is the U.S. team leader. He was the editor at Newsday's health section for many years. We have a lot of newspaper people, because we believe we're an online newspaper. Um, and uh, so we, for instance, are going to the heart, the American Heart Association meeting this week. Uh, we're sending two reporters and an editor. We're also sending a TV producer, a, uh, a, gra a graphics person, and a photographer. Uh, so that all, all the media will, you know, Ed, I don't, I'm not going to have to ask these folks for, for those elements. Those elements are going to come flooding into us because that's the way that kind of meeting is covered. Last year at the, at the Hart meeting, we had 36 distinct stories over a period of four days. Uh, so uh, I love to go to that newsroom and watch everyone else sweat. Uh, especially my former colleagues at the Journal and the Times. Well, the Times doesn't even send anyone. They can't afford anyone either. Um, so, you know, it's AP and Reuters and the other wires. Finally, um, what do we, how do we get our news then? How do you, how do you get to us? Uh, the email. Uh, I only get about four or 500 emails a day because the Bloomberg, the Bloomberg has also become the messaging system for all our users. So we use that as our internal messaging system. I have an office without walls, as you can see. I'm talking to people around the world, around the globe. So your email that would come in also has to interact with the people who I, who I work with. So it's very hard to see emails. Uh, the reporters feel the same way. But you know, as you get to know the reporters, uh, you, you know, I don't have to tell you your job. You know, it's, it's still in this electronic world is interpersonal. So that's my only other message. You just got to find some, someone at Bloomberg, get to know them, come to our office, 
get to meet them. They like to go out to lunch, believe it or not, every once in a while. We let them to go out to lunch, but uh, not often. Um, uh, you got to come into a Bloomberg office to see the machine. If you've never seen what, what we do, it's hard to understand. We love to give, we like to show off because it's an extraordinary product. Uh, very quickly, I, I'm almost using up all my time here. If I go to, if I go to news, right, let me just try that again. Yeah, I might not be able to pull this off. Um, if you go, if if you're interested, if you're interested in seeing the health news, if you go where it says news there and underneath let's say industry and then and then to healthcare, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to see only about six stories. And in other words, it'll be our six top stories that are running uh, that day. In uh, let me just see. Let's just see if I can pull it up real fast. Yeah. Um, but you can you can sort of see, but you'll only see the first top the top six stories. And uh, I often find a lot of the stories that are running in Bloomberg by actually going to Google. Uh, I'll type in uh, I'll go to Google. I'll type in Bloomberg. I'll type in the story. So if I want to type in Bloomberg and bird flu, if we have a story on bird flu that day, you can it'll drag you back to this public website, which isn't showing you a lot of the news it, on on this way, but it's inside there somewhere. Uh, so you can see the kind of stories that we're doing, of course, they're very investment and company oriented. So there's a story here uh, about an asthma drug and also the fact that Estellas, which is, by the way, a Japanese drug company, plans to enter the, uh, the India's pharmaceutical market, sort of a reverse move as the Indians are, and their generic business is moving uh, worldwide. So again, our focus is very business oriented, but it covers everything. We cover all public health issues, anything around the world that affects uh, economics, finance, uh, we're interested in. It doesn't have to be company oriented. So we're very interested in what's happening at the academic institutions. Uh, we're always going to ask what the economic link is. Almost everything that you folks are doing has an economic link, even if you don't know about it. Uh, someone is supporting it. Uh, someone is likely to license it. Uh, there's patent issues. Uh, that's our focus. Uh, I think I've, I've hit my 15 minutes. So. Uh, I can tell you a lot more and go on forever. Uh, I'm thrilled to be at Bloomberg. Uh, I, I would never have said that, uh, having had a wonderful career beforehand, and I'd love to share it with you. So anyone has more questions or is interested, just give me a uh, call, and I'll try to, uh, try to accommodate you or at least pass you along to the right person at Bloomberg who can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so even Michael went less than 15 minutes, which means lots more time for you. We have uh, two folks who are in the audience, oh certainly, who have uh, wireless microphones. Can I see where those people are so that you know, here in the back of the room and in the center of the room, off to my right, and in the center of the room, and what we'd very much appreciate would be if you would announce your name and your affiliation so that you know we know the direction you're coming from, and plus this is being recorded for audio so that others who hear it will know who's asking a question, and then go for it. So, who has the first question right here in front? And if you wait for the microphone, we greatly appreciate that. Hi, I'm Sherry Singer from Singer Communications. And uh, my question has to do, I think everybody addressed this, but Sally, perhaps you could, as a daily newspaper writer, talk a little bit about this. Um, and I know USA Today has this as well. There are s now sort of sliding deadlines. So where it used to be that you would call a reporter from 9.30 in the morning till noon or 1 o'clock, now lots of reporters are working Sunday through Thursday. Some of them are working later at night because of this 24-7 <coughs> news cycle. So when is, if you really feel the need to make a call, when is the best time to make that call? Um, probably, probably earlier in the day is, is better, although we do have, um, even for the health section, which closes, you know, it, it appears on Tuesdays, we start closing pages Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we actually are closed Friday. And that's something else for people to know that a lot of people will call me on Monday and say, oh, for tomorrow's health section, I'll say, way too late, you know, it's gotta be much earlier than that. Um, so it, earlier in the day, just generally, I think is a better time. Um, I don't, do you yeah, think that's fine? Earlier yeah. in the day, I would agree with that as well. Um, our, our health section, we have a health section every Monday, but we have health news throughout the week. So, we're, you know, afternoons are really a tough time. For me personally, 
if you want, Fridays are a good day to get me because we don't we don't publish on Saturdays. We have a weekend edition, so if you have to have to call me, then Friday would be a good time to do it. Um, uh, we do still doing web stuff, you know, publishing for the website on Fridays. So earlier, even then, you know, 10, 11 o'clock. But once it gets past noon, it's it's really it, day is too chaotic really to to do it. I promise to try to keep my head on a swivel for questions. Um, I do know that there was someone at this middle table who immediately shot her hand up, and then we're going to come to you. Okay, so we'll start here. Name and affiliation, please. Yes, I'm Elizabeth Strike from Columbia University Medical Center, and I know that Sally Squires mentioned that you use Eureka Alert almost on a daily basis. I was just curious from the other panelists if you use Eureka Alert or Newswise or other services to get story ideas on a regular basis. Sure, uh, we use Eureka Alert. I uh, have a subscription to that. I look at it usually on a daily basis uh, if I can. Um, that's pretty much the only service that I really use because we do, reporters get a lot of the, uh, the journals I get by email, um, but most of the story ideas you know, bubble up from the reporters because they're out in the field, um, either covering conferences or, or you know just dealing with sources on a, on a general uh, basis, but I do look at Eureka Alert. As far as the other ones, um, not too much. Uh, PubMed, uh, the, the reporters use that a lot, but for me, I, just, I do use Eureka Alert. I suspect that uh, the AP reporters and editors are using it and others as well. Uh, just quickly to address your question about uh, when to call, um, because we're 24-7, if you're going to an editor, which is the preferred route uh, any time, really. And if the editor isn't available, then it'll bounce to another editor who will be available. It's uh, fortunate that we're a large enough organization, so if there's always somebody there who, if it's really urgent, is going to be able to uh, talk to you and, if necessary, reach the reporter who really is working that story, uh, wherever that person might be, whatever that is. Great. We'll come right over here. Thank you, Ria. I, I'm Diane Sines with uh, Oceana, which is a large uh, international ocean conservation group. And uh, my question is, hey, it's no secret that science and medicine is big business, uh, particularly the pharmaceutical industry. Um, how do you assess whether a study's funding has influenced research findings? Uh, there are lots of issues of conflict of interest. Um, as a young journalist, I was taught to follow the money. And it doesn't appear that um, many news organizations, particularly the Post recently, um, always ask that question first. Um, so I'd, I'd like you to comment on that. Was that particularly for Sally? Um, anyone? Who wants anyone. To okay. I can, I can answer it. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, sad to say, uh, and as a science journalist, because I, I, I still think of myself as a science writer. I'm, wearing a manager's clothing right now, but it's just the disguise. Uh, in real life, I'm still a science writer, and uh, anyone who when it goes into science writing writes about the, j the joy of discovery. Uh, it, it's really what, you know, I mean, some people call it gee whiz or whatever, but it's really the excitement of being able to write about uh, exploration and, and ex normal kind of people doing remarkable kinds of things. And so it's kind of sad that we've all become, we've been burned. Uh, and a bit cynical uh, by the conflict, the economic conflict of interest that are inherent in a capitalist world. It's sad to see doctors taking money, and you know, you know, being speaker, you know, taking money and being speakers for pharmaceutical companies, and and then not having the the good sense. But you know, doctors are this way, by the way, of not having good sense to to tell people that that's what's going on. Not to say that it does conflict them, but we all know the appearance these days is just as bad. And in fact, covering up the appearance is even worse. That's the world we live in right now. It's a post-conflict world, I like to call it. And as a result, journalists have become abnormally uh, uh, cynical. And I, I hate to, uh, to criticize my colleagues, but so many of them either I hired or worked with me in other newspapers. But I, I find the coverage in some of the major newspapers, and I, I don't follow the Washington Post that closely, but I would say the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal is overly, overly negative in its coverage of, of, of uh, the healthcare business. Uh, I think it's justifiable to, 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 to make sure you question 
conflicts and include it in the story, but it seems to me the bias is now that almost everything is, uh, is as a result of some sort of conflict or economic uh, justification, and that's just not true, and as a result of that, I think we do our, ourselves and our readers a disservice. So, that all said, I love to say that said, you gotta say that once in a speech these days, right? That said, that said, uh, uh, as I said, I go into a story, <laughs> this is why it's sort of, I laugh at it. I go into the story with the, with the sense that my readers uh, are sophisticated enough to know that there is an economic interest there. And so uh, I, I don't need to wave the flag, but it, it certainly needs to be part of the story. And then, the, so the question is, how much of an economic interest is, is actually affecting the quality of the research going on? It's very hard to know. And I think as a journalist, all we need to do is make sure we point it out and let the readers try to decide. I mean, that really is the job of, an, of, an, of a journalist. And it's terrible uh, when a PIO or, or any public relations person or the source themselves goes out of their way to hide it or obfuscate it or even lie about it when you, when you ask. Uh, they should all, everyone should be upfront about it. That's the world we're living in. And I think the more upfront we are, the, the less people are gonna be cynical. But you know, maybe that's not true. Anybody that else want to say that, 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 that was my soapbox because it's a huge issue. I really care deeply about it, so I'm glad I had the opportunity to stick in my five cents. Adam? Um, yeah, no, I, I just want to say that I, I do agree it, it is sometimes quite challenging to sort that out, and at least in my experience, I, I do my best. Um, I just, I, I, I want to mention one experience I had, it, it actually involved a public information officer. Um, which may be relevant, it was, and, and it came down to, we sort of got in a, a little bit of a conflict because it came down to the title of this particular doctor who was, he was the president of a medical organization, I won't say exactly what it was, but he had just transitioned, um, he wasn't even, he wasn't in yet, he was, he was, he had just been nominated or something, but was gonna take over, um, and he was also, the president of a medical device company, um, and he is offering advice to people about what sort of medical device um, they should be using. Um, and I, I felt it was very important to at least say that he had that other connection. Um, but the public information officer for that medical organization <laughs> did not agree. She really, really did not want me to use that title. Um, so I, I don't know what to always do in those situations, but it definitely gets sticky. Um, and I do think that is, is if we can be open and transparent, then that's got to help at least. Rick, can I just add yeah, one other point I just had thought about, which was uh, just in line with what I said. Uh, I think in order to be sophisticated in the, in the kind of, you know, just people on this panel, you can see the level of sophistication that has occurred now in medical and science reporting. It's very different than when I started 25, 30 years ago. I, I just assume, even in an academic institution, that whoever you, researcher you're talking about has an economic interest of some sort. The discovery has been patented, it's probably already been licensed, and he may have a company uh, around it. And if you're not asking that question, and you're not presenting that information uh, as uh, truth in advertising, then you're doing yourself a disservice, and, and you're losing a bit of credibility that every journalist would really appreciate. If I could just add from my perspective, um, on occasion I will train people at pharmaceutical companies or doctors uh, in regards to media training, how to get their message across. Um, and one of the things that is always key in those conversations is where's the money coming from? And you'd be surprised how often uh, people who are, you know, seemingly prepared to address the media don't want to talk about the funding you know, will become offended by the question. It's like, you know, you've got to deal with that because that's really just part of the world we live in. There, there is this uh, marriage, if you will, between science and money, and it's true and it's real, and we all should know, you know, where it's coming from. That's just part of the transparency, and that's really an important job of the news media. So uh, there, there's a certain level of disappointment when there is, you know, someone sort of trying to hide the, the actual factual financial information because, you know, it, it really does make you question their integrity, and you certainly don't want to come back to them as a source again. You know, that, that's not the PIO I want to talk to the next time. So, my two cents worth. Next question. Yeah, right here, pink sweater. She's coming. Hi, I'm Allison Whitney from the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center at Georgetown University. And my question is, how do we get our experts to be the guys that you call um, when you have a story and you need a comment, aside from, you know, having done it before and it worked? Prep them so well when we use them one time 
that we have to go back to them again. Make them available quickly. If we want somebody now, we don't want somebody six hours from now, or gee, you know, I can't get him, but maybe tomorrow morning he'll be available. Doesn't work anymore. That's the key thing, availability, and being good in what they do. When you said uh, prep them, I was really thinking that you were going to speak in regards to having them be proactive about the other story areas that they could cover. I always appreciated it when a physician or, or you know someone who was an interviewee would let me know about something else that was coming up that I might want to follow up on. Because if you have a positive exchange with that person, it's worthwhile coming back to the well. So um, I, I would throw that in as well. Anybody else want to come in on that? Uh, one thing I would say, um, if I mean, if you can encourage the scientists to be active in the conversations that they're having in their journals, a lot of times, even if it's not a study they did, if it's somebody commenting on a study, then I'll call that person because I know they're interested in it. Um, and I know it's not my platform, but I'm just throwing this out for your general consumption. Uh, another area that is really key is that humanizing the stories. So if your docs or your researchers or your contacts, the people that you're helping to promote, have told you about a particular patient or situation. I know uh, recently uh, you did a story about a very rare disorder because somebody who was a PIO on the ball thought to think ahead and mention this, and they followed up and actually did the story. Would you talk a little bit about that? Oh, it was the case. It was a good story. It was a story yesterday that we did on this uh, child with a rare skin, um, rare genetic de defect where his skin would not attach to his body. So every time that you touch this child, uh, the skin would bruise or fall off, or it was just a horrible situation. The child lives in bandages and is bandaged uh, tw uh, twice a day every 12 hours. It's just a horrific thing. But uh, he was going undergoing a rare procedure at Children's Hospital in Minneapolis. Now, the PIO there contacted a reporter who did a story last year on a uh, teenager who was undergoing, he was a, he had epilepsy and had hemophilia, and they were doing a surgery to remove part of his brain to, uh, to cure his epilepsy. And it's kind of risky in that procedure because this, this kid had uh, hemophilia, but the reporter did a great job with it. PIO remembered that story, contacted that, or a year later contacted this reporter, and so we were able to send, uh, and gave us good lead time so that we were able to send the reporter to Minneapolis and a photographer who, uh, who was also trained to do uh, video for the website uh, spend some time, a good week with the family before the surgery to f see what their life was like. The family, if I remember correctly, is from New Jersey, but they were, uh, they were pretty much living out of this hospital in Minneapolis during this procedure. So reporters spent a good week with them and a photographer, got video, stayed th through the procedure, and immediately thereafter, we did a story, ran yesterday on the life front as a cover. Go on our website, I'm sure the, videos, the video is very powerful. Um, that was one of those stories that, it, it, when I was talking about earlier about having impact, this is more of a human interest, gee whiz kind of piece. It's a great human interest story. But that was a result of a PIO um, remembering a reporter who did a story that was similar and doing a good job with it kind of thing. Yeah, and, and let me just add, that, that's where relationships really do pay off, that um, as you get to know certain reporters or you know certain interests of, of reporters, that it can really, and you know the venue, and, and if you're familiar with the, news organization I used to write a lot for um, many of the sorry when many of the women's magazines and you really do have to know what their what how they present stories I mean parade presents something in a different way than um, men's health and and from the post and so really knowing the market but the it the possibilities between the print venues and what's on the web and radio and television and I mean you know podcasts I mean it's just, just there's a there are a lot of ways to slice and dice to your story these days, and it, and it really is a, a wealth of opportunity. You should also be aware <clears throat> of what is happening in the news in terms of spot news stories, so that if CDC comes out and says, we have a problem with this medical whatever, and you have an expert in this medical whatever, and you're fast enough to get to us and say, hey, I've got that expert, that's going to save me time of looking for someone. I'm going to go with your guy rather than calling the University of Pittsburgh or whatever and uh, going with, uh, with their person. So 
if you can help us with our laziness, uh, that's a great, well, and, great benefit. And I, I just have to say, Ed won't remember this, but I used to teach in American University, and we brought in a class to uh, come to AP Radio. And it was the most fascinating morning I have ever spent. And I thought our business, this was several years ago, so our business has changed, but the speed at which they have to work was phenomenal. And there was somebody at a desk who was, who was doing two live feeds, one from Capitol Hill, one from Chicago. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it was like broadcast news on speed. You know, I mean, it was just amazing, so. Don't forget about your local radio stations also in your own community because that can generate something. If you have an expert talking about something, particularly here in D.C., if you've got somebody on WTOP and half of the journalists or more are driving to work listening to WTOP and hearing your expert, they're going to say, hey, maybe I'm going to use that person. No. Spoken as a true former news director at WTOP. <laughs> <laughs> a question right here in the center. If you'd hold on just one moment for name and affiliation, please. Thank you. I'm Susan Cahill. I'm from NIH from the National Institute of Mental Health. And um, when I send you guys press releases, pre-embargo press releases, I have this much space to get you your attention in the subject line. And that's going to be taken up with a really pithy description in plain English of the finding. But you guys are swamped with emails. So in this much space, <laughs> how am I going to get your attention? Um, when you, if I say that it's a press release, like I write PR, do you see press release not notated there and think, oh, you know, maybe this is somebody from a, a company trying to get me to sell their product for them? Or do you think, oh, it's a press release, this might be a good lead? And part B of the question is, if you see that it's coming from NIH, does that make a difference? Should I put press release, should I put NIH in the subject line? Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, you, you use the cachet of your office. Uh, just put new finding or, or study NIH, and we'll, I mean, we'll definitely read it. I mean, you, I don't think you have to worry about your email not getting read, no matter how many. I mean, we always look at CDC, NIH, those emails, press releases come in, FDA. Uh, we'll, we'll take a good hard look at every single last one of those. So. Can, can I just ask on behalf of all the others in the room who are not from NIH? <laughs> Because, you know, I mean, let's face it, everybody's trying to penetrate this thing. I, but I, you know, I, it's true. I, I said, I, you know, I get, you know, hundreds of emails a day. I would look at every single last one of them, you know. And I, I can look at an email pretty quickly and tell if I'm going to do a story on it or not. Or, if, you know, if I pop something up and it's like a, you know, a bed bug study brought to you by the makers of, you know, you know, bugs be gone. Right. Yes. Delete. <laughs> I'm done. But I looked at it. <clears throat> You know, and if I'll see some, you know, I, so we look at everything, every single email, whether it's a government agency or a university or, a, you know, a PR firm or whatever, we take a good hard look. I mean, you know, I'll pop it up and look at it. What I don't do, I don't necessarily respond to every email because I just don't have the time to do that. And it's just, um, and I know sometimes PR people get upset, like, can you please, uh, you know, reply would be nice, please reply, you know, and return my, and, you know, it's just like, I'm not trying to be rude, but you know, if I did that, I couldn't. I couldn't edit stories. And, you know, that's what they pay me for. So, okay. So, t two things come to mind for me. Um, a, would you at least forward it to a colleague? Yeah, if it's something that's, you know, I think that could work. If I would forward it, like if I get somebody, somebody sent me something on, you know, science. That's not my thing, but it sounds interesting to me. I would quickly forward that to Sue Kelly or, or one of the science reporters. Or if it's something that uh, nutrition is actually handled by. Uh, Nancy Helmick's reporter, she doesn't actually work for me. I'll just pop it over to her real quick, you know. Um, but, I, but I don't, you know, follow up by calling the person back and saying, hey, I sent your form email to so-and-so. I just do that. These are things that we just do very quickly so because we have to move through them. Just by show of hands, how many of you would forward it to a colleague? Do you have time yeah. to do that? Yeah. 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 It takes two seconds to hit the forward. Okay, back. everybody's on board with that, so that's okay. one thing. And if we could get from each of you at least one word in the subject line that you would definitely pay attention to? <laughs> I'm uh, trying to help you out, folks. Yeah, what I, would that one well, word be? Well, first, just I do look at, uh, like, like Glenn, I look at uh, the government uh, 
the emails first. I mean, we just, we have to. Um, I look at academia second, and that would be really high on my list. And then if I know it's coming from a company, and you know, I'm probably less likely, or, an inter or a special interest group, um, the, there will be some exceptions to that, but then I'm probably, I'm probably, that'll be at the lower end. You know, just like you have to do in your Franklin Covey planner, A, B, and C, well, you got to do this too with, you, you just don't make you don't have enough time to do it all. So what would, in the subject line, um, <laughs> this is really important, I don't know. <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and don't overuse it, because if you use it, I mean, if it really, really is important, put something there to say that. But really make sure it's important, so. Adam? Uh, I guess one thing I, I don't know what I would put, but what I wouldn't put maybe is, um, just those certain buzz were, you know, breakthrough. If it's really, really too exciting, then it's just delete, you know. <laughs> oh, did, did you get that, folks? He said if it's too exciting, it gets deleted. The single word, of course, is money. But that aside, um, don't waste time putting NIH in the subject line because I see that in the email address anyway. Uh, don't put press release in the uh, subject line because I don't care if it's a press release. What I want to know is what's the key? What's the nut of uh, your information? Study says blah, 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 blah. Six or seven words, that's it. Get me the nut and I can judge on that. Uh, in the subject line, sex usually gets my attention. <laughs> and your spam filter. <laughs> and, and, but, but all my reporters have learned that, so that's how they get my attention. So. Uh, I, I just wanted to say uh, there's a system at Bloomberg if, if it's, you send uh, press releases to release, R-E-L-E-A-S-E, -E, believe it or not, at Bloomberg.net, and it goes to a, uh, both electronically and, and to human to our headline writers who then forward it, to, because they're very good at, at this, to either an editor or to a reporter, because they know the right reporter and the right editor. So it's a really good resource. The other thing I would do, because we, we have so many reporters who specialize, I didn't bring a list, but I'm willing, uh, at, you know, through email, if you get my attention, to, to refer you to the right people. But we, we have reporters who really, really specialize. And, and uh, as you get to know their specialties, I would take advantage of it. Uh, we have four reporters in New York who cover the pharmaceutical industry, but that means they're covering almost every disease. So you can, you can hit them. We have a reporter who covers mental health disorders, most especially in San Francisco, and another one who covers infectious diseases in, 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 uh, in Boston. But because we're global, uh, my, the, my, the person who covers emerging infectious diseases is in Singapore, and uh, the person who covers world health, it, of course, as you know, would expect is in Geneva. And so it's very, it's very highly specialized. And, uh, I'm more than willing, if I have the time, and I'm just saying I'm willing, if I have the time, to sort of direct you to the right person. But once you find that person, if you get anyone at Bloomberg on the phone at, among the health and science, and now we're doing, by the way, education, I wanted to make sure people know that my group also covers higher education in particular, as well as now the environment, uh, global warming, carbon trading, uh, you know, anything related to greenhouse uh, gases and uh, sustainable energy. Uh, that almost any of the reporters, it's a very collegial operation. It's extraordinary that way. People really work as a team. They'll send you to the right person. You know, just as you were speaking, Michael, and I promise to come back to your questions, uh, there was a question over here about how do I get my researchers to be the first people you think about from Lombardi. Um, and one of the things that, because we spoke about this before we actually started the discussion, I said to Michael, are you sure you want to invite people for a tour? Because, you know, you get inundated. Everybody and their brother shows up. But he promised he was, and I heard him say twice if he had time. But it, it might be a good way to give your researchers, the people you represent, an idea of how the news cycle works, the impact that they can have on it if they have a little bit of people speak capability and personality always helps too. Because let's face it, we're interested in interesting people. And, and sometimes that is the downfall, uh, you know, when you're working with academicians or people who are in research labs all day, you know, they don't. They're not like the rest of us. So uh, not to take anything away because we need them, but to give them a sense of, of how it functions, that might be a wonderful opportunity. And then, you know, of course, you yourselves go as well. So I know there are questions somewhere in through here. And where's the nearest microphone? I guess they're on both sides. So whoever gets to someone first, you pick. 
Okay, she's gonna stay over there. Uh, my name is Mary Spiro. I'm from the Institute for Nanobiotechnology at Johns Hopkins University. And my question deals with negative news. Um, since nanotechnology is an emerging science, we have a lot of people who are interested in it for the medical benefits that it could possibly provide. But when I'm dealing with reporters a lot of times, they're more interested in what are the public health, potential public health risks, what, uh, what's gonna happen to that nanoparticle that you put into my body 10 years from now. So what I'd like to know is what are some of your suggestions for pitching stories that have good news without constantly being inundated with questions about the potential bad news that could possibly come from the science that you're, that you're working on. Is that for anyone in particular, by the way? Anyone. anyone. Maybe, maybe um, yeah, one thing I would say is pitch them to the science section and not to the health section, because I, I do run into troubles like that where, you know, maybe I'm interested in a story and it's a really neat gee whiz science story, but I'm in the health section and my editor wants to know, is it gonna kill people? Um, so, <laughs> yeah. But you know, we have to, we have to ask those questions. I mean, it, it, we would be remiss if we didn't. So it's gotta be both. But as long as that caveat is in there, it's a new technology, it, you know, it's an interesting possibility. It's kind of like why we also, at least in the health section, don't cover uh, anim much animal research because it's too early for us. But it might be a great gee whiz kind of story and it might be a great video for the website. I mean, depending on what or, you know, graphic or something. And I think Rhea would teach this to you in media training. Uh, have a message that you want to get across. Uh, be prepared to answer the questions about the negative side of things, but then come back to your message. Yes, this is true, but here's my message. Well, yeah, that's true, true, but here's my message again. And eventually the message will get through. Eventually. <laughs> here in the center, I know we had three or four hands. Can we get a microphone over here? Wonderful. How about this center table where there are two women, three women right there with their hands raised, and we'll just do one, two, three, okay? My name's Michelle Blom, and I'm with the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm proud to say that you can call on us anytime we have good experts, too. <laughs> And we have. <laughs> um, my question is to do with infrastructure. We have a great deal of difficulty getting the New York Times, the Washington Post, some of the national broadcast outlets to pay attention to us because we're not in New York and we're not in LA and we're not in Chicago. What can we do for you with our infrastructure to help you come to Pittsburgh? Well, I, I've actually been to Pittsburgh and, and actually wrote a, a book with one of your former, um, <laughs> one of your former scientists. So um, uh, we use Pittsburgh a fair amount. Maybe not. I know you have a really good news bureau and you send out a lot of releases. Um, but uh, you know, Pittsburgh is is east almost as, as far as I'm concerned. So it's a great place to go. I don't know. Our online video network did uh, something uh, with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, within the past year or so. Uh, because of an interesting email that was sent that uh, piqued our interest. I don't remember the story, but I do remember that we, we jumped on it. Uh, we get emails from University of Pittsburgh um, at least once a week, maybe more than that, and I don't think we've responded to one since then, but that's not because, it was basically because we haven't had an interest in that subject. But if you keep presenting subjects in an interesting manner, thinking about uh, the possibility of video and not just what can be written about a story, uh, we're likely to try and find a way to get to Pittsburgh again. Okay, and at that same table, yes. I'm Maggie McDonald. I also am from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, there has, I may be addressing what is a reporting niche that is closer to science than say health but there is a lot of interesting, um, there are often interesting findings that are not yet news you can use and not yet easy to humanize, like the animal studies and even the work that precedes the animal studies. What is your guidance, but yet they're important scientific advancements. 
What is your guidance about getting those um, stories covered? Because it's an area that I'm, I've always been interested in. I mean, uh, when I worked at the Wall Street Journal in particular, but not so much now, once something became an actual product, I was less interested in it because of all the vested conflicts that were hard to pick out. So I very much like to write about something in its very early stages of discovery, uh, often when it's really uh, even, you know, something involving a test tube or a new technology. Uh, it's, it's always a kick to me, uh, five, ten. I've been around long enough to see things that I wrote about that were preclinical uh, actually reaching the market. Uh, so in my experience, the way I've been able to tell those, uh, to, to do articles about those uh, issues is if I can tell a story. I mean, I, I, you must have heard this a million times from journalists. I mean, inherently, journalists go into the news gathering business because we are uh, storytellers. Uh, you know, we're on the nonfiction, uh, uh, you know, side of, of uh, literature, I think. And so we like, those of us who, who do like it, like to be able to tell a story. We don't necessarily want it packaged for us, but we want a hint that there might be one there we can go after. So I think that's the best way. Either the story of the discovery itself, a scientist, some, some piece of serendipity, some bit of surprise, conflict, tension, gee, all the elements of storytelling, humor. Uh, detail. I think you'll find with scientific discoveries are more likely to get covered uh, as opposed to a medical thing that's in its infancy because so many things look so promising in, 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 a, in, a, in a mouse study or in a, uh, in, a, you know, in, a, in a culture and they just don't pan out at all. So usually like you know drug studies, I usually, you may, may look at something at phase one, phase two, but by rarely we'll write about it. Maybe phase three is when we really start to get you know, an interest in something. But even then, there will be a ton of caveats in whatever story we do because it's you know, so, um, so early. You know, a great scientific discovery or new technology that's you know, in its infancy, yeah, I, th I think that has a good possibility of getting covered. But medical stuff, we're going to really, at least in my case, we're going to have a really be wary to, to cover something unless it's been, you know, some clinical studies start backing it up and that kind of thing. Um, I would say w one thing that might help, because we have the same problem with U.S. News, if it's too early, then a lot of times we just can't really do it. Um, but I would try to find out when there are maybe special issues or, you know, we do a lot of these sorts of guides, you know, maybe there will be a vision guide. Um, and normally we might not cover, you know, this odd little technology relating to eyes, but during that issue, ah, then it makes a lot more sense then. So if you can find out when those are and, and pitch then, it would help. I'm just going to ask, are you also from the University of Pittsburgh? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm Phyllis Fisher. I'm with Hospital for Special Surgery. We're an orthopedic and musculoskeletal specialty hospital in Manhattan. So, uh, And my question is picking up on something that Ed said. You said the preferred route for a pitch is through the editor. And yet others have said, follow a reporter, see who has a specialty in a particular area, follow up on something they may have written. How do you feel about going to reporter versus editor? Sometimes if you go to reporter and you get a no, there's always the opportunity to go to an editor who might assign it to someone else. Whereas if you go to an editor who says no, there's no other recourse. Uh, I like the editor route, maybe because I'm on that side of things more than the, the reporting side of things. Uh, on the other hand, if you've established a relationship with a reporter, which you should be doing, obviously, uh, I would uh, suggest that the uh, reporter route is the way to go uh, first. Uh, editor for general, uh, out of the blue, uh, over the transom stuff, uh, reporter if you've got that uh, relationship already. And, and let me add, you know, a story is anything that happens to a reporter, you know, <laughs> and and, and um, a series is anything that happens to an editor, <laughs> and a project is anything that happens to the managing editor. <laughs> there is great truth to that. There is. How about uh, the gentleman right there, uh, blue sleeves? Yes. Surprise, it's you. Hi, I know Sally and, uh, well, first off, my name is Chris Condon. I'm with uh, the American Society for Microbiology. Sir, would you mind standing so we can sure. get a look at you? Sure. And uh, Sally and Ed both mentioned uh, sort of this multimedia pitch uh, using video, graphics, audio. 
and Ed referred to what I would call B-roll. Um, but what, 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 to you, what is an ideal pitch like that? What are you looking for as far as this multimedia content? Do you want questions from the expert quoted in the, in the news release? Um, what exactly would make a successful multimedia pitch? Well, if, do you remember the story recently about um, they showed, there was a study that showed that uh, who your friends are may impact on how much you weigh? The, and I've forgotten now which group put this out or, or where this originally came from, but the packaging of it was, was very good because, and I think it came from one, originally one of the journals, but there was an animated graphic that we ended up putting on our website that showed these um, social networks and how they impact, so we had that. This, this group also happened to do a video interview with the, the scientists. Now, I wasn't as excited about that, but I think our website was, and I think that wound up as well. And I. They don't think we were the only uh, website that used it. And I don't know what, I don't know if that was in QuickTime or, or what it was in, but, um, and maybe somebody else on, on the panel can help because to say what it is that's most easily uh, sent for, in terms of video, because I don't it's know. It's not so much in term, it's not so much what's easily sent, but what we would like to have to illustrate the story. If your story is about, um, something being grown in a petri dish uh, in a lab that we might not have access to, but you can videotape that and provide us with that videotape. That's something that's useful to know about in the pitch. If uh, you are, if there's a, a time element in the story, it's, it's real fresh, it's a, a spot news story, and you have an expert who's available, and you're at a university, and your university has the ability to put your expert up on a bird uh, and provide a satellite interview opportunity to us, uh, that's something that we'd be very interested in knowing about right away. Uh, from the radio standpoint, uh, we'd like to know if people are available for telephone interviews. Uh, if NASA has something uh, that has to do with the, the Hubble telescope and a picture that it's taken, Obviously, we want to see that picture either in still or video form um, because just the text isn't going to tell that story for us at all, really. Uh, the image is what's uh, needed. So think in terms of what we're going to need to uh, develop the story and pre present that story to a viewer or a listener or a reader or all of the above. And that's what we're looking for. And if you also have in, in our newsroom now, and you may have this f ability too, kind of like that bird that, that um, Ed just talked about, we have an ISDN line that allows me as a reporter to go on air and sound like I'm in the studio with you know whoever I'm going on air with. And so y those are not hard to set up. And likewise, we have a camera, and I know many other news organizations do as well. So those are other things you can do. Michael, did you have a comment? Uh, well, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, Bloomberg is, is inherently electronic and multimedia. Uh, almost every story that a Bloomberg user now clicks on has a series of attachments, both audio and visual. Uh, we have a graphics department now. Uh, I didn't mention that, you know, we're so involved in graphics that we're sending the graphics editor, a graphics editor, to the Heart Association meeting. So we're looking for all that. It doesn't need to come in the package, although of course, if it's there and the reporter can access it, fine. It's just knowing that it's readily available or that we can get it very quickly electronically, uh, that you, know, you have the capability to do that. Uh, you know, our, our, the Bloomberg system has become so powerful that, that actually a Bloomberg user can actually watch Bloomberg TV on their terminal or go back and get almost anything that's been archived and watch it as if it's live TV. And so we do a lot of, a lot of those kinds of attachments uh, uh, just uh, far, you know, far ranging. So almost any story that that is that has the potential for that that doesn't make that available is, is you're missing an opportunity. Uh, I would just say that um, for my days in like local television news, uh, one of the things that we tried so hard not to do was to be totally dependent on other people's graphics or their video or you know, we wanted an independent expert. And I have noticed over the years that things really have changed. And part of that has to do 
with not only the, the shrinking availability that we all have to gather news because of the 24-hour news cycle, but the idea that, you know, we have limited resources financially. So what you're hearing today is really sort of a, a total spin on, you know, some of the things that I used to hear, which was, you know, don't use the patient that they sent us, find a local one. Uh, don't use their expert, find somebody, you know, maybe at Lombardi or, you know, University of Pittsburgh. Um, and the point being that it just shows you how, how uh, stressed the resources are when it comes to media coverage, and yet everybody is pretty much looking for the same thing. There was a day when, you know, radio and, and print reporters would not be asking for video, and yet you hear this repeatedly. We need pictures, we take our own cameras, you know, everybody's pretty much using the same fashion and style to cover news. We just need more of it because ultimately the end user is hungry for it. So I think that's a great opportunity for you. I just toss that out there. Um, let's see, I have, I've neglected this side of the room and I know that maybe earlier you had your hand up, so I'm gonna come to you. Hi, my name is Wendy Lawton and I'm a senior science writer at Brown University where I publicize biology and medicine. And I wanted to follow up because my question was very similar to the last question about multimedia. And so this question is mainly geared to Ed and to Michael, but I think any of the panelists could, could probably answer this question in terms of what you're looking for for multimedia. So as our organizations are changing to kind of get on this bandwagon, we have to look at investing in technology in our own offices. So should we be going out and getting um, equipment that would allow us to record podcasts or get digital cameras. Brown does have an ISDN line. We do have a satellite TV studio. But in terms of the kinds of technical things that we might need in our shop, and if you could also just talk a little bit about does it really matter, and I guess this probably really depends on the story and sort of what, how stretched your resources are at the time, like do you want us to create it? Do you want us to do the graphic, to do the, photo, to do the photos, um, to provide some of the... Um, the interviews, or is that something that you would do? Because I think, I think technically we're gonna need to sort of link up at some point, so we're not investing in technology or creating things that you just can't use. I think you've already made a good deal of the investment. If you have the ability to uh, put somebody up on a satellite and make them available for an interview, that's something that's very useful. Same thing with the ISDN line. Uh, would we use your uh, still photos or video rather than our own? Uh, Considering the closest uh, person that we have uh, shooting video to Brown would be in Boston, uh, probably we'd rather do it ourselves if we could, but if we couldn't, then uh, we would take yours. And frequently you have the ability to uh, get into a lab that we can't get into anyway. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's what I would do. Uh, just uh, I would be working, not, it's not so much the technology, it's the mindset and working with uh, your professors in making them comfortable with having that technology intrude into their world. Uh, by the way, if I'm not, if I remember correctly, I think Ralph Begleiter is a Brown uh, graduate. Uh, you know Ralph from uh, his CNN days, I, mm -hmm. I assume, but you've got uh, a resource right there uh, in your alumni uh, pool who can uh, help you out tremendously in that area. I, I uh, would say Ed has sort of covered it. Bloomberg is you know, only you know, slightly different. In, but uh, the availability of someone to be able to go to a studio and be able to do a satellite link up and be able to do an interview will probably be something that w would be made use of if, yeah, because what would happen is that would both go on Bloomberg TV, but then that particular interview would then be ar archived and attached to the story uh, and it's there forever. Uh, uh, you know, we have our own graphics department, but they often take ideas from, from you in, in creating their own graphics. Yeah. Uh, they might c combine it, and if time is really short, we'd, we'd of course use it. Uh, so you know that that is useful, um, and and uh, amazing. Bloomberg has the resources right now and the ability to take photographs almost anywhere in the world. We have freelancers, thousands of them. They're all terrific. So uh, it's it's a matter of making someone available to us uh, uh, to get photographed, and and we can. You know, I've had instances where a story is, is going to run in 10 minutes, and I believe it or not, if, you know, that 10 minutes is fast, probably 20 minutes. And I've been able to get a photographer, you know, electronically to get it to me, to get to the, to the resource. So it's your job of just making, helping make that available. I would, I would add to that, too, because in our case, I, I don't necessarily want you to do the graphic for me. I just need the graphic information. Mm -hmm. And then we can build the graphic either or we have uh, interactive graphics that we do online or the print graphics. 
Uh, we just need the raw material and the access. And, and, and like Bloomberg, we have freelance photographers all throughout the world and, and throughout the U.S. So I'm not really looking for, really don't want photos from um, that are taken and given to us. I'd rather have just access to whatever it is that we need to photograph. You know, if, if maybe I could serve as an interpreter here, if you've got it, use it. And if you can make it available to them, they very likely will use it. Or otherwise, at least give them enough lead time so that they can get all their ducks in a row to get what they need. So I, I think that kind of sums it yeah, up. Yeah, and let me just emphasize that lead time. I know it, it, with this 24-7 news cycle, um, even for daily stories, we really do need that stuff ahead of time because that gives us more opportunity to contact a variety of people to really to read and digest and get this information. And so while it may be a daily story, and, and by the way, I also just in the last week encountered a group who again will go unnamed, but who wanted to give me a report and they wanted to, me to sign a non-disclosure statement to get it and said it's just like what you do for the Institute of Medicine and for the New England Journal. That doesn't happen. I don't know where this group got that. <laughs> then they wanted to put caveats on who I could contact and I could only contact the experts that were involved. And again, I laughed. I mean, I just said, well, you must be kidding me. So we actually didn't do the story because there were just too many uh, you know, things. I'm sure it's a good report. I'm sure I'll come back at it. But um, be very careful about what you do, the caveats that you do put on. R r good news organizations w w will abide by those embargoes, and we know that. And, and w you know, we'll work with you. But don't be afraid to give it to us. And we're not going to distribute it surreptitiously. That's not our desire. So, There's a gentleman over here in the blue vest. And a microphone's coming to you, sir. I'm Rick Borschelt from the Genetics and Public Policy Center, and I paid Sally to set me up this way on the embargo question. It's a little more of a philosophical issue, but recently uh, I've noted that a number of news releases get distributed that are embargoed for no other reason than they look sexier when they're embargoed. And I wonder how you guys respond to that, and in more general terms, embargoes used to be considered a reporter's friend. It gave you some lead time to prepare a story, to get things together. In a 24-7 news cycle, is that still working for you? How do you guys respond to embargoes these days? That's a good question. I hate embargoes. Uh, I like to have information in advance that's coming to us that isn't going to anybody else in advance. But I, I don't particularly like uh, embargoes. They are useful if, you fact, if, in fact, you want to distribute uh, a story to everyone at the same time and also give us a lead time that we're looking for. Uh, but you also um, have uh, reminded me of something that I wanted to mention, and that's uh, morning drive. Uh, the 5 a.m. to uh, 10 a.m. time period, uh, particularly important to radio stations, uh, becoming more and more important to television stations where the audience is shifting to uh, the morning rather than the nighttime uh, television viewing, and uh, the peak time of internet clicking. Uh, that we've found. So if you are releasing information at a 9 or a 10 a.m. news conference, it's going to miss morning drive. Uh, and it works well for newspapers uh, reporting next day in print, but it doesn't work well for their websites. It doesn't work well for radio. Uh, you might hold your news conference to go into greater detail at 9 or 10 in the morning in this very fine room, but don't uh, be adverse to getting a call from a radio station and going on the air at 7 o'clock in the morning in advance of your news conference and uh, doing the story with them because you're going to get a much wider uh, use of the story that way than insisting that they wait and attend your 9 o'clock news conference. Um, f for U.S. News, in, in terms of embargoes, I mean, in the short time that I've been there, um, I think w I started out reporting on a lot of studies, um, and so embargoes were incredibly important to me. So I think if you're if you're pitching just a study story, this is the newest study that that helps a lot. But 
about halfway through since I've been at US News, we have a feed now. We have this feed health day. They do all the study stories pretty much now. So at this point, we don't really care about the embargoes as much. So I think it depends on what kind of story you're pitching. One of the things in my experience is that uh, maybe it's not happening as much because I'm not r reporting, so I'm not seeing it. Would we would we would get these? Uh, mostly, this happened at the Journal. We, I'd get something that says embargoed, you know, and I, I have an embargo agreement as a science writer with a few organizations: New England Journal of Medicine, mm -hmm. uh, Lancet, uh, Nature. You know, I've made those agreements. In other words, I've overtly made that agreement. It's like when I have a conversation with a source. And the source is talking to me. He says, and this is off the record and keeps going. I didn't, I didn't agree to that. You can keep going if you want, but I didn't agree you were off the record. You have to make that. I mean, journal, newspapers, as you know, and journalists, as you know, have gotten in a lot of trouble in the last few years talking about what's on the record, what's off the record. Then there are all these great uh, terms, you know, background, deep background. And I, but, you know, these don't exist, by the way, you know. I mean, in other words, the reporter the journalist or the news organization and the source makes an agreement. And it better be very clear. It doesn't have to be in writing, but it ought to be very clear. And so if you're sending me something that says embargoed on it, it's not embargoed. You know, you just send it to me. You know, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> you know? And I would, the thing that drove me crazy is when someone would send something and break someone else's embargo. In other words, you're an institution, you have a, you have a release coming out either at a science meeting or at, in a journal, and you're sending it to me beforehand, you're sending it to me outside of their embargo. And, and so you gotta be very careful about that. It's a very competitive field right now. And, and you know, uh, journalists, we, we don't have, a, you know, there's no license here, by the way, there's, and there's no real rules. You know, we're, we don't need to follow the <coughs> rules of ethics. We'd like to because it seems to make people more likely to, uh, to uh, trust us and, and, and thereby use us, but there's no rules. You know. Does anybody want to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Clarification. Um, oh, I'm sorry, would you hold on for the microphone? I'm Marion Glick with Porter Novelli. Um, Michael, I appreciate it for us if you could just clarify if we're from an academic organization or a pharma company and we have data coming out at the Heart Association next week, uh, it's embargoed by the Heart Association. In our communication with you, we say it's embargoed per the Heart Association. You would then honor that even though I'm sending it to you rather than the Heart Association saying, or would you not? Based on what you just said, it was a little confusing. Uh -huh. But but my agreement is not with you. It's with the Heart Association, who has asked me to abide by that embargo in order to register, <coughs> or with the uh, publication. But if you're sending it to me blind, you've just broken their embargo as far as I'm concerned. I know this is, by the way, a lot of people don't agree with this. And by the way, I'm not necessarily going to do what I just said. I'm just saying I could if I wanted to. I, I happen to know you, and I know your institution, right. and I'm not going to be a jerk. But you know, the thing I'm finding out right now, and this is a, a huge issue, is that because I can spider every Would you bring your microphone web, a little closer? I'm sorry. Because we can spider every website. I love that term, spidering. You know? Some people call it scraping. But because we can do that every website, do you know that almost, uh, we have a, actually an administrative assistant who's doing the study right now because uh, almost every embargo is, is being broken around the world by someone, every study. What I, and I've, I've got someone doing now for almost every study doing a, an al, one of these alerts I told you about, and almost every study is being broken anywhere, somewhere in the world, whether it's in Australia or in London or Budapest or South Africa. And if I wanted to, if I followed that correctly, I would then realize, I sh, I, the way you have to do it is you have to go to the, the journal or the institution and say, listen, someone's broken your embargo. They say, oh, it's a weird little group in, in Buenos Aires. I said, no, it's on the internet. Right. It's been broken, and I'm now gonna break it too because I'm Bloomberg. And as I told you, this is not a joke. I either have to be first or I'm going out of business. Yeah. And so yeah. you send me something like that, you're at risk of, of, of breaking an embargo. And you better be very clear that the person you're sending it to understands that, they're going, that you're helping them by sending it, you want to be helpful, 
Uh, but it depends on who you've sent it to. You know, you, there are people on our headlines desk who don't know you from Adam. And they, they see it. They don't see the word embargo, by the way. And they're just going to run it out. Sally. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, that in order to get the early editions of New England Journal, JAMA, Lancet, whatever, we have agreed that we would embar abide by the embargo. But it's true that I, it, you know, on, there have been occasions through the years when I've gotten information not from a not from Porter Novelli or from another press group, but I've gotten information in, a, in an independent way on a particular story, and that's absolutely fair game. And what Michael is saying, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but he's right, you know, that, that once this stuff goes out, and it may help explain why this group was so worried about having people sign statements that they didn't want this, you know, this stuff out. Well, one of the things we're finding, by the way, I ran into this at, uh, trying to remember what meeting it was, because it was a pretty hot issue, and I, I got a kick out of it. I'm sorry to say, uh, but an analyst had gotten a pre-version a pre of an abstract at a science meeting and put it out in an analyst note, and I considered that breaking the embargo, mm -hmm. because first of all, I said, well, listen, I said to the organization, if you're going to send the abstracts to an analyst, God, you know, it's going to go everywhere. Well, it's a very narrow audience, it's not really broken, blah, 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 and, you know, I finally made, had a compromise issue because... The stock of a, of a company, by the way, who, who, uh, uh, who had the patent to or whatever, you know, this was a product or something, was moving. And if I, I how can I ignore that? Right. I had to say why the stock was moving. And so, you know, the way we, we, by the way, compromised on it is I just, in very general terms, said that there was positive information about this product. If I could follow back, to help. this goes back a little bit to having that relationship with reporters and knowing the reporters and all that. For instance, like Steve Sternberg will be at this heart meeting, and, and I know for a fact that he's gotten a lot of information ahead of time from various groups on stuff, and, and it's helpful to him um, very much so. And I think the people trust him, have a relationship with him to know, you know, that. So I think, you know, if you have that relationship with a reporter, um, then you can feel safe in sending that kind of information out. The delicate dance of the embargo continues even today. That one never goes away. Back of the room. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Rhea. Uh, John Seng with Spectrum. Just wanted to um, ask about disclosure. We talked about disclosure before in terms of, you know, our institutions, our organizations, our clients, our spokespersons, you know, their relationships. But what about disclosure with regard to um, material, photographs, video, things like that that are sent to you. You know, we've seen the video news release industry pretty much, you know, roll over and die, scorn heaped upon it because of, you know, just the rejection of packaged news pieces that, you know, where news organizations do not fully disclose and so on and so forth. So I'm just hoping that you can give us maybe a little update on what your policies are as far as, you know, as, you're, as all of you are really working in the electronic you know, era now, whether it's, you know, quote, print or, you know, video and moving pictures or still pictures, what are your policies as far as, you know, disclosing, uh, you know, or attributing the uh, material provided to you? Thank well, you. if we, rarely, rarely do we use, like, photos and, and video that are just given to us, and, if, and I imagine if we did, I'm sure we'd be credited to that organization, but usually that's why we prefer just to have lead time and access that we can do, our own photographer can do the shoot the video. Our photographers are trained to do video and audio, I mean, um, excuse me, video and, and still uh, print uh, photos and some audio too. So we'd rather just do the, handle it our, ourselves. The, the only disclosure issue that comes up with us is that we've gotten really, uh, when it comes to juveniles, uh, people under 18, we, uh, we have a form that we uh, had a parent sign on, on a lot of these stories. To, uh, giving us authorization to, to shoot them and to, to talk to them on that kind of thing. That's, we don't have to do that, but we've, we've gone a little extra mile recently, but that's pretty much it. But I, rarely do we use, you know, material. The only B-roll B I can think of is if you had like a generic photo showing or an image of a building kind of thing. I think the only, during the Cryon um, flu vaccine debacle in 04, I think it was, I think we may have used a photo from the uh, of the company that was, you know, in um, in England, but nothing. One example, one example might be uh, animation or photos of cells, things like that. Where, with all due respect, maybe your folks don't really aren't in a position to grab these images and mm -hmm. things like that. And and if you don't use them, that's fine. But there's sometimes there are clearly imagery that you know you know 
uh, that you may not be able to uh, procure yourself. But anyway, it's just. Well, we, we would definitely credit that yeah. too. And we would too. We would yeah. credit it's, it. It's important uh, in terms of uh, video, particularly, and audio. As uh, you may well know, the FCC has uh, significantly cracked down on use and disclosure of video news releases. Uh, they haven't yet on audio news releases, but they probably just haven't thought of that. Uh, but uh, from an ethical standpoint and from a legal standpoint, uh, we're very strict that if we use something from a VNR, we identify that uh, on, the, on the video and uh, we identify it verbally if it's an audio uh, news release. We'd rather not use a VNR or an ANR. There are some times when we have to because it's the only way we're going to get uh, little vials of vaccine coming off a production line or something such as that, uh, and then we have to identify it. Of course, the, the extreme of that is, you know, when you've got video coming in from anybody anywhere around the globe, right, sort of the, the YouTube concept. Oh, so yeah. it, it just kind of keeps multiplying itself in a bizarre way. Other questions? Yes, in the green. A microphone is coming to you. Hi, I'm Caitlin Gorman from Pascal Communications. You guys were talking about ways to reach you, and you can't, you don't have time to get a pitch via phone but you don't always return our emails, and we often need to respond to our clients with ways that we have interacted with you, so we have to make follow-up calls. I just wanted to know, is it easy for you to just pick up the phone and say yes or no, or is that still a little bit annoying, or what process should we go about following up calls with you? Um, well, if you have to do it for your client, you have to, you know, obviously that's your business, but you know, if, if you absolutely have to have an answer, I, I'd rather do it email. You know, I can say, you know, I'm sorry, we're going to take a pass, or it's, not, it's going to be a short note or something like that. But, if, but um, it just because you put please reply on, on your email every single one, I just can't do that. So, but if you push it, then yeah, I'll, I'll respond to you. But it, most likely, I'd rather, I still prefer email. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I, I'll do what I can as time permits, but usually I, I just say, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't talk. My phone is, t is not a good venue for me, and, uh, and you're right, we don't always respond to emails. But uh, having been on the other side of it, pitching to editors at other, you know, like magazines and different things, you get, I mean, this is part of the deal. You know, sometimes you get responses, sometimes you don't. It's, it's sad, but true. I think certainly from um, my experience as a reporter, uh, emails were key, and this has been a little bit, I don't know, five years since I've actually been in a newsroom every day. But the idea of not wanting to be on the phone is because I'm serving that, I'm saving that venue for the day that I'm doing that story. You know, I need to be in contact with the people who are giving me the information I need for that story that day on the phone. So that's why for me, I never wanted to have anybody else have my phone number unless they were working with me that day. Of course, once they get it, they've got it. But, you know, again, we're asking you to be judicious in using these things because, you know, we're all inundated with information. And obviously your jobs are not easy, but the bottom line is, is that if we can help you do your jobs a little better, then it works better for all of us. <clears throat> Other questions or comments? Yes. Hi, I'm Michael Newman from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we've heard a lot of great tips here today about what we should do as PIOs to get your attention and help promote our stories. I'm curious about the other side of the fence, and I'd like to ask if each of you could tell us what your worst experience with a PIO has been. <laughs> and hopefully I'm not one of them, so. I don't, is, does everybody want to know that? <laughs> yes, they do. Okay. Um, I, I'll give you two examples off the top of my head. Uh, I love it when the people send me an email and call me with, uh, within five minutes of the email. <laughs> And did you get my email? Yes, I got your email. Did you read my email? No. <laughs> you know, you, you got to give me at least a half hour, you know, just look at your email, okay? So just, you know, no need to do that. Um, did, and calling the next day. But the, the, my favorite, though, this, this is a long time ago, um, someone claiming, they said they were representing a, uni a major university on the West Coast, had this great study uh, that they wanted to give us, as, a, as an exclusive and, and uh, as, you know, sounded really good. I put a reporter on it and then within, but it didn't take, the, but they hid the fact that actually that person wasn't representing a university, they were representing a, a drug company that was sponsoring something and it was all just, you know, it was loosely tied to this uh, researcher at, uh, at, the, at the university. Well, you know, as soon as, it didn't take it's too long to find out, but they obviously went to some link to hide that from us. Story was canned immediately, 
And, you know, I, re I remember this person, so I don't deal with this person hardly at all, if ever. So that, that's the worst case scenario off the top of my head kind of thing. But, you know, but on the day-to-day -day basis, calling me within 20 seconds of sending an email. Yeah, the, the, my biggest pet peeve, in, and I know this is probably in the training for a lot of public relations firms, but it's the person who obviously has just dialed the phone or pressed the phone, and then they read me their script, you know, they, and I know that they have to read it, and, and I stop them midway and I say, no, 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 wait, wait, you know, and if, and if I do have time, and I'm, you know, try to be generous and say, look, just talk to me, but when they mispronounce the words that are involved, you know, you know it's not a good thing, and you know that they're just doing a checklist, so I hate that. So that's uh, another uh, maybe bad thing is um, sending the same email to every single person on staff. Um, we we sometimes have a good time sort of talking about these certain emails that we get. You know, everyone got the same one, and it's the same cheery tone. It doesn't work. All of the above, plus the emails that come every day, dear Ed, from someone I've never heard of. <laughs> Uh, who is very familiar with me all of a sudden. But the worst, I think, uh, and I can't disguise the agency, I suspect, because of the nature of the, the story, but we had a government agency recently uh, who recalled uh, a dangerous item with an HFR on the recall. It was embargoed. They sent the information of this dangerous item, but we couldn't use it, according to their embargo, for three or four hours. That was... Uh, you know, have millions of tales, as I'm sure you have with reporters. It's a lot of fun being on the two sides. I've been, you know, I've been doing this for 35 years, and I've got a million tales, so, you know, I save them for drinking stories. <laughs> but I, I think the one thing that irritates me, is, I forget who mentioned it, is, is just, you know, someone who gets on the phone says they represent Pfizer when they're really working for Edelman or something like that. I mean, I just, I don't understand that. Uh, so, you know, it's a real turnoff. I'm sorry to say, you know, I'm sure it's true of my reporters. It's, tr it's definitely true of me. I can't answer the phone. I mean, you know, I don't, ha I don't have time for my wife during the day, and, you know, that's a real problem. Uh, and we can talk about that also. Uh, <laughs> but my, my horror stories are all dealing with uh, commercial public relations people at, at companies, mostly. And that really is a huge problem that is, is for a totally different session. Uh, their, their inability to respond, to respond in time, respond accurately, appropriately. Uh, the, the, the thing I love the best is, you know, and, and I'm talking about calling a, a big company up and they just don't return my call uh, as a reporter. Uh, when they do return the call, they ask me all over again for the question I asked them five hours ago. Uh, and then they respond, well, I don't know, because I know they don't know. They're supposed to go out and find the answer. And then one person recently said, can I go off the record and then rent fr from a press release? Yeah. So yeah. That was, I really enjoyed that one. The, the, the off the record, I think, is really, really bears underscoring that, it, you know, there isn't really, it, you see this a lot in television shows and, off, and people bandy it about, but truly at the Post, we're really not supposed to take anything off the record. It's got to be at least on background, and that means that I can use the information. I don't necessarily have to use the name with it, and I could negotiate that. But I really don't. People say off the record, and for the most part, I go, no, <laughs> you know, we're not doing it. So it's, it's just better for all involved. My only other pet peeve is uh, in, um, that if you are going to have other people in the, if, if you're going to do a speaker uh, call, it, it's really gracious to let the reporter know that you're going to be on a speaker phone. Um, that is is something else that if I'm going to put somebody, if I'm going to take notes and put on a headset or, I mean, just kind of some of the general rules of politeness, which we can all get too busy and forget, are, are much appreciated. But, um, you know, I, I don't put anybody on a speaker phone that I don't ask first, and I hope that the same thing is true. And if you're going to be on a speaker phone with a con in a conversation, uh, it's really good to not to interrupt um, um, and let the, the interview go as it, as it should. If, if you want to add something later, fine. But, you know, it, that's, that's really important, too. Well, those were some of the horror stories. And I know we're kind of wrapping up on time, so I'm going to take just two more questions. And then we'll uh, hear a couple of words from Patrick, who wants to give us a conclusion. Yes, sir, right here in the front. Oh, it's too late. You're next. 
Hi, I'm John Rogers from New York Presbyterian Hospital and Well Cornell Medical College. Very fast question uh, as a follow-up to a lot of this multimedia stuff we're talking about. I'd love to be able to send you attachments like of a press release or a picture of a baby that was born blue, maybe to grab your attention. But I'm concerned about attaching that to an initial pitch to you because of spam filters. I mean, my organization kicks those out all the time. I'm much more inclined to send you a pitch verbally and then promise the additional elements. Is that more appropriate or should I give it a try? I'll give it a try. We have a, a spam filter that's totally useless. I mean, it, it catches like uh, um, a lot of, it, it captures a lot of good stuff from good organizations and, and, um, and a lot of the garbage out that, you, that we all get in our email comes flying through with, with no problem whatsoever. So because of it, it's so useless, I have to go to my spam filter. It has a block thing that you just, it doesn't take too long to go through. I go through that every day and, and, and approve the, like, you know, for some reason, ASCO, God love them. I don't know why they're you know, blocked, but you know I, I approve them every day, and they come through. Um, and then you know delete all the other garbage. So you know I'll just give it a try. Don't worry about it. I would say I would say don't send it. Don't send the actual attachment. Just have a little section in your press release that says video or photo, and then say we have 50 photos of this. If you want to look, you know, let us know. Because otherwise, the, my email box will explode. And oh yeah, yeah. there's like a huge, like tons of yeah, but just like one thing, just to peak interest. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Others, okay. Right here, this lady in the tan jacket. Okay, I tell you what, because we're we've got a lot of time. I'll get to you in the black jacket as well afterwards. No, no, I'm I'm dooming you for now. Yes, I said uh, I was only going to take two more. Okay. Ellen Turnus, University of Maryland College Park. And one of our favorite office moments is when on a Monday or Tuesday, our boss opens USA Today or The Post and sees a series or a story that's been a long time in the writing, and he says, why didn't we let them know that we have expertise in this field? <laughs> and the same way, you don't know what's going on everywhere. We don't know what everybody's writing on. So since we have you here as a captive group in front. Are any of you or your reporters working on some long-term things that we might yeah. know about? Very, very smart. Yes, uh, but we're not going to share that with you here because uh, don't want them, uh, your competition to know. But if, um, you know, again, that's a trust thing too because, you know, I, I'm, I would be hesitant to tell you uh, or someone I didn't know, okay, we're working on a series that's going to run uh, in two months on X, Y, and Z, you know, kind of thing. Um, so again, that's just going to be you know a, a relationship give and take kind of thing. I, I would, you know, if you, if you want to, you or your boss, I mean, you're not that far away. Want to stop by sometime and, and just you know show me, you know, give me that source list that everybody has. Uh, every university has those. You know, I'll be glad to do that. You know, it just takes time, but and you know, just look at the reporters and say when that series ran, it says uh, contact like. Um, reporter and say, hey, I, I, no, I can't help you for this, but you obviously cover this topic. Um, for future stories, how can I help you? And then eventually that would build and lead to something else. And, you know, the sad thing is that um, it used to be when stories were a little bit longer that I, if I interviewed someone and they had something decent to say, I would, you know, try to at least get them in the story in some fashion. The, the hole is shrinking so much that, um, but, and this won't help you with your boss, and I, I don't envy having to explain why your expert wasn't in a particular story, but um, I, everything, everybody that I talk to for a story it informs me in some way and really is useful. And I think it, it doesn't hurt in a, gen, in a gentle way if you do see a series to not go, well, that was great, but why don't you do a follow-up story on this and here's my expert. But maybe even, I mean, you know, reporters love compliments. A compliment, you know, liked that series a whole lot. If you come back at this topic, I want you to know we've got this guy or this woman and this person and just really, really brief because if it's a big topic, we probably will be coming back to it. And it does help to kind of cast that net wider. Yeah, I would just underscore that. I mean, I, I think it's pretty common to interview six or seven people and, and quote one or two of them. I mean, it just, it just happens, and it's frustrating when, when people yell at me about that. It just happens sometimes. The editors cut things out. It's the editors. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Final question. I'm Megan Rowe with the University of Virginia Health System. 
Um, my question uh, concerns video pitches. One thing we've been doing at our organization is filming our experts who, you know, are really good on camera, of course, and sending the pitches to reporters, you know, DVDs, like five, th four or five experts at a time. Um, for those of you who do print reporting, um, how useful is that to you? F is that for you all? Are you likely to even look at something like that? Or are you just going to say, I don't have time to look at that? Or are you likely to look at it and say, you know, this guy is well spoken. You know, maybe I will call him sometime. You know, I'll probably, if you send a DVD, I probably would not have time to look at that. I think the better approach would be, again, sending an email with, okay, this is the, the expert here, and this is his background or, or his or her qualifications, and they're really good. Uh, we have, you know, you can send an attachment of like one little. 30 second clip of this person. And I think that's enough for us to build on and say, okay, we can take this further and do something else. But if, if you send through the mail a DVD of that, I, I probably wouldn't have time to look at that. Yeah, I, I would echo that. Um, also, just one other tip that when you do have your experts, um, ask them to please give us all their contact information. So emails, cell phones, home phones. Um, we, pr I mean, we promise not to, you know, really hound them in any in any terrible way. But um, a case in point, yesterday, um, a, an NIH official that I've interviewed a lot, I had his cell phone, and when he wasn't, he's retired. When he wasn't at home, I actually got him on the golf course, which was great because he was not playing, but he was just walking, and he could he could quickly answer a question, and and it was it was really helpful. And you, if if your experts are available in that fashion, particularly, I found scientists are great about email, and if you if we can zip a quick email and they can zip something back, even if it's just to say, well, I'll call you at three, and this is what you know we'll we'll talk this amount of time, you can really get people in there fast. So that if you can encourage them to give us all those ways of contacting them, it's really helpful. Well, let's say thanks to our panelists. Uh, as I ask Patrick McGinnis to come forward, I'm going to remind you once again that inside your packets, uh, there's survey information that we'd like to uh, take advantage of. So if you please fill that out, and then where should they leave that, Patrick? There's a box on the registration table. Box on the registration table. We'd appreciate hearing your comments, knowing what worked, what didn't. We're so glad that you came today. Thank you so very much. Patrick McGinnis. Um. I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming. We really appreciate uh, you coming, and thank you to the panelists again for being here. We appreciate you taking the time. And uh, thanks, of course, to the Spectrum and Eurigalert staffs for uh, helping make this event happen. A um, couple of the panelists mentioned the value of information that they've received at scientific meetings, so I wanted to use the opportunity to uh, plug the AAAS annual meeting, which is coming up in February in Boston. Um, press registration for that is now open. Uh, you can get uh, press information for the meeting at uh, eurekalert.org slash AAAS newsroom. Um, also, preliminary press programs are ready. Um, if you would like to receive one, please drop your business card in the box where the surveys go, and we can send one out to you. Um, and also, I wanted to mention that the program for the meeting is online uh, with, with abstracts. At, uh, you can find that at AAASmeeting.org. So, and thanks again, everyone, for coming.